him with Mauler and the drinker Getting trashed with the web screen dictators A cheap night, cause I'm feeling kinda thrifty Got a ten pack of beers and a bottle of whiskey Hop up the cork, have a glass of wine That's the old thing Trouble walking in a straight line Look for the Amino Noir It's open bar With our host Mauler and the critical drinker All righty. Hello, everybody. Merry Christmas Hello. to you. Hello. Oh, another wonderful uh, night in the bar. Uh, yes, I know we are very late and very homosexual today. I think we've gone <laughs> for some kind of new record. This is like, what, 11 minutes late? So that's pretty impressive. That's why we did it. We wanted to set a record. So there it is. Done now. I think, uh, yeah, Gary's got some competition now. What can I say? Yeah. This is the problem. When we all get talking backstage, we're just like, ah, should we just blow the stream off and just hang out for a couple hours? <laughs> I mean, I've that regret of like, shit, people would have loved to have listened to the past 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. yeah, I know, yeah. It's like, I keep thinking like, okay, we need to go now. We need to go now. This is good stuff and then we just keep on rolling it's great um mm -hmm. but yeah anyway welcome everyone it is uh well, bar number 77 and damn we're almost at christmas it's, we are uh, the 21st now damn it's uh it's getting ho, close ho, ho. yeah ho 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 indeed i've got my my swanky christmas top on it's even got like a bobble attached to it and i couldn't reach it there there we go i've got my christmas outfit as well gary forced me to wear it he was uh it's very mean to me on real bbc yeah. so i was like okay fine yeah, well, I, I imagine it took a lot of effort to get changed into that, so we appreciate it more. Well, I just stood outside for a bit, and someone put a carrot on me and a hat. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Anyway, we've got a hell of a panel tonight, so why don't we start bringing some people in? Let's do it. All right. First up, we've got all the way from sunny Australia it is Shadowversity. Hey, back, guys. Man. Merry Christmas. Woo! I'm sure you guys are getting into the Christmas spirit with all the nice tropical fruit, the cherries and and the mangoes. Oh wait, you don't get that. You got you get snow, lots and lots of snow, don't you? Yeah, we, we don't get British Christmas. Way. We get regular Christmas. <laughs> yeah, we don't get upside down Christmas like you crazy guys. Blazing heat, but like it, it it's normal for me. It's weird. And so like our tradition seriously, like fresh, you know, cherries like gorgeous big juicy cherries is uh kind of the tradition and i love them and so that's like a staple cri uh, christmas thing cherries and then of course smoked ham smoked hams up mm. smoked ham sounds all right oh yes yeah. i mean i've got cherry rum somewhere on the shelf so i can think <laughs> yeah, there you go. yes <laughs> uh good to be here guys merry christmas Sure, we're gonna you, man. have some good fun conversation about some top, like truly excellent media. I just have a feeling. Well, we got some Maybe, fantastic yeah. stuff that's coming out right at the tail end of this year. So yeah, it's can't amazing, wait to talk about right? it. <laughs> anyway, let's bring in our next guest. He has got hair that's spikier than mine and sunglasses that are even cooler. He is Chris Gore. Hey, hey, uh, a drinker. Uh, this is my <laughs> failed attempt to compete with you when it comes to sunglasses. I think I'm gonna. I think I'm just gonna yield to you. Uh, Give up Aaron. straight away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I can't. I can't pull it off. You pull it off well, but uh, just happy to well, be you... here. And you know, we almost we're late, probably because of me, because I I just I don't get to see everybody, um, that all that often. So it was fun to just chat behind the scenes. We should have recorded it actually. All the we'd have evidence on everybody. So that would be that would be yeah. great. I admit yeah, to a lot Christmas of things Christmas. back there, but you'll never be able to prove it. So that's the important yeah. thing. There you go. Well, Merry Christmas to everyone. And Happy to you, man. You. Cheers. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Anyway, next up, we have got, uh, this is making his return. Um, he is the man who's got a story about just about everyone and everything in the movie business. It is Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett, and it's a pleasure to have you back, my friend. Well, it's good to be back. Christmas is all around us, as uh, the great movie Love Actually will tell you. <laughs> so cheers to that cheers to richard cheers. curtis and to you wacky brits making another christmas classic that shows up i mean between whamageddon and love actually it wouldn't be christmas if the uk doesn't provide us with these great cultural touchstones so thank you well you are welcome world um yeah love actually is one of those ones where like obviously it's a whole bunch of interwoven stories and there's certain ones that i tend to skip and like there's you want to get to the good ones but it's uh it's a fun movie for sure um here's to yeah, colin like, yes colin go. frizzle <laughs> and his quest <laughs> which probably would get canceled today but 
I'm there for the, it. They have tried to cancel that movie so many times. Like, I've seen so many articles where it's just like, ooh, that's a movie that didn't age well because, you know, there's like, there's a guy who's a stalker and the guy having an affair. It's just, don't fuck off. Like, that's it's wildly in the movie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you for coming back on, my friends. It's great to have you back as always. Thank you so much. Uh, and last up, we have got the man who is too successful for Twitter to handle. He is Eric July. <laughs> hey, man. What's up? What's up? What's up? Nah, man, it feels good to be uh, back. We got an incredible panel here, man, to be talking about everything going on in the uh, the world of uh, entertainment and, and whatnot. But no, seriously, man, I appreciate you guys uh, having me back. No, it's great to be back. It's great to have you back, man. And it was great to come on your stream as well a couple of yes, weeks back. I enjoyed we that. We did do that. That was fun. That was the first time we had you on uh, on our stream, man. We had a blast talking about everything. Even I learned some new things, but that was that was a fun, fun stream, man. We got to do that again for sure. Absolutely. We seem to have lost someone as well. Who just dropped out? Chad. Chad <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, that crazy. That crazy down, yeah. Hey, I got him. He's gone off to get some cherries, I think uh anyway no thank you for coming on man and uh well while we wait for shad to come back i say we just fire right into it um there was an article that came out actually that uh robert just made me aware of just as we were getting ready to start from variety uh talking about the year that hollywood has had and i think this just sums it up perfectly um i'll just read you a few lines from it i won't bore you with the whole thing but uh here we the title is strikes box office bombs and huge leadership vacuum Hollywood says goodbye to the worst year in a generation. I mean, they're not they're not wrong either. No, no. Um, when the clock strikes midnight on uh, January first, Hollywood will close the book on arguably the most tumultuous twelve months in a generation. With the town roiled by devastating strikes, the implosion of the superhero movie, and deep divisions on everything from AI to Israel. But as Tinseltown ushers in a new year, will it suffer from a monster hangover? Many of the most vexing issues remain unresolved. Uh, there's a huge leadership vacuum, and that's not about to change since Michael Nathanson, former head of MGM Studios, he says Bob Iger is not really that guy anymore. If he hadn't left in 2020 and returned, he would be that guy. And Ted Sarandos is still not trusted enough by people for him to have that leadership role. I think people are like, what's his motive? Are we really going to turn this over to Netflix? Um, yeah, I mean, he's not wrong. Um, Bob Iger has proven that he is not the guy, and he certainly has been, hasn't been since he came back. And Man, yeah, looking back over this whole year on 2023, it has been a nightmare year for Hollywood. And I don't know if 2024 is going to get any better either. Wow. It's unlike anything that we've, I don't know, we've seen. I mean, uh, the whole generational thing, like worse than a generation, that, that sounds like it makes it sound so bad. But I guess when you look at it, data, I mean, it's not incorrect, um, I guess. And, um, I, I find it funny. I, I don't, I, this is a little bit of a side note, but it kind of ties into it. Um, I don't know if you guys talked about it yet, but this whole supposed that they're, they're discussing this merger between uh, Warner and um, who is it? Paramount. Paramount, right? Uh, yeah. Which I, I I don't know financially how something like that can even happen, considering they're basically both in so much debt. Um, yeah. So I guess they're like gonna combine debt and make kind of this debt Megatron. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's the debt singularity. It's just gonna suck. So they're like, don't worry, we'll debt and our debt will cancel each other out. <laughs> that's how debt works. Yeah, <laughs> apparently that's how it works. But it is, it is fascinating. These guys are losing so much uh, money back to back. And to your point, uh, drinker, like I don't. Next year, what what do we have to look forward to? Yeah, I mean, we got civil war. From this year. We've oh, got yeah. well, black. We got yeah, Cat Black Falcon America. Yeah, uh, I will I mean, say. By the way, about the whole generation thing and the POV, right? When you're living in it, you're like, oh, it's the worst of times. And someone might be like, oh, you just feel that way. But in 10 years, I'm sure it'll be the worst of times all over again. It's like, I will say, I have been rather snobby when it comes to quality of movies my whole life. But these past recent few years have been particularly shocking <laughs> in terms of like quality as well. I say that for movies. It's media, the whole, the whole lot. There are some things that have been created that had I, like, I don't think I'd believe them if I'd seen them. Uh, like like given to me as a premise 10 years ago i think i would have been like why would they make that there's no way they would make that and they're like no they did lots of them too it's not like i, I well. think it's a year as well that like where all our predictions came true you know when we we've been warning for ages look the mcu is in trouble people are, are gonna lose interest in superhero movies disney is gonna sink themselves with like the, the horrendous decisions that they're making and it's all happened We've been proven right. 
and it doesn't really feel as good as I thought it would. Like, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to be in this position where we we prophesize the worst possible outcome and it happened. But that feels like that's where we're at. I think one of the craziest elements of the predictions is that we all of us didn't guess how low Captain Marvel's box office would be, even though we were the people to come yeah. to for the lowest guesses. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, was, how did that even happen? It's like, mm. I was wildly wrong. I was I was quoting things like four, I went to 350, I think. Minutes. Yeah, that was that my, was, you were yeah. the lowest of us, and still even you were nowhere near it. Nope. And again, it's not like there's there's not really that much schadenfreude to be drawn from it. It's more just, yeah, we kind of knew this would do bad, and it has, and we we kind of knew all the Warner DC movies would probably flop this year, and they have. You know, and it's not it's not great to watch studios fail, but at the same time, you know, they're making bad stuff. And like, what are we supposed to do here? Like, just pretend that it's good and like carry on. It's uh, the thing, yeah. we have to make our own fun. For example, Shad being raring to go and excited to talk today, and now he's just gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was like, I'm so ready. <laughs> it's like go straight out the gate, fall over, face plant. Done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's a red shirt now. You just, yeah. you know, you know what? I, an open bar if we didn't lose someone. What I think is is strange to me is that Hollywood has existed, you know, the entertainment business, movies have existed for more than a, a century, and the way movies are made, and the way they were marketed, and the way they have been directed to the public has not changed until recently, and and what changed for Hollywood is that suddenly they started making movies for the globe, for the entire planet, instead of concentrating on the domestic market. And one of the things that that did was it immediately removed, for instance, comedies, which are colloquial. Comedy somehow doesn't travel worldwide. They stopped making mid-level comedies. So there's very few comedies. That was a huge part of Hollywood's output. But when you go on a global scale, you can't make comedies anymore. And I was thinking about the other day, I, I don't know why, but I love Drinker. You've been on Russell Brand's channel. You Thankfully, you said something very nice about me, and I thank you for that. One of my highlights of the year. <laughs> Russell, Russell Brand was in Get Him to the Greek. I love Get Him to the Greek. And I was showing my girlfriend. I, I go, we got to watch this movie. She'd never seen it. And as I'm watching this film, I'm thinking to myself, now it was, it's a sequel to Forgetting Sarah Marshall, which is another pretty good movie. And I said to her when it was over, I said, this movie would never get made today. Nobody, and there was a whole, like, the Seth Rogen crowd was making movies like uh, like I Love You, Man, and Get Him to the Greek, and Forgetting Sarah Marshall. These movies are gone. And these were theatrical movies that made money. And this was 10 years ago. Hollywood now has become, they forgot that movies are a collision of art and commerce. Now it's only commerce. That's the, the Wall Street method hollywood studios now are, are making 100 million or 200 million dollar movies that are designed to make a billion dollars and if that is your expectation every time you've destroyed your own business model and i think that's what we're what we're facing is that you have an industry that was working that is no longer working because they have bought into a different business model that you can't apply to movie making but they tried to do it and they've destroyed their own industry. I think uh, it's partly that um, that drive to always go bigger and bigger. And you, you've seen the, the average budget of an A-list movie just go up and up over the past 10, 15 years. And yeah. I hate to be the guy who's always like, oh, comic books ruined, comic book movies ruined everything. But like, I think the superhero genre played a big part in just bumping up those budgets because once you start making such heavy use of CGI in your movies, the budgets just creep up and up. And this is where you got to this level of, you know, um, $200 million now was considered relatively lean for a big budget superhero movie. You were getting films that were way up in the $300 million range. That's absurd. Absolutely absurd. You know, like reshoots just became expected and normal, like complete, not just reshoots in general, but reshooting the entire movie. 
Which yeah, I mean, it's it's all of the stuff that goes with a, a huge investment of money like that because you don't want to take risks when you've got three hundred million dollars on the line. You're going to play it safe. I mean, Indiana Jones Five was probably the the ultimate example of that. I know it's not a comic book movie, but it's <clears> it's built around the same formula of like it's got to have loads of CGI, it's got to have loads of um, action sequences that that weren't done with practical effects. It's all got to have um, this stuff that just adds to the blow of the budget. When the the original Raiders of the Lost Ark was made for like um, a tenth of what this was, it's it's insane. I, of I don't know. It's never going to work. I, I think that it's a combination of, of kind of the two concepts because while yes, they're spending all of this money and the content's also bad. I wonder where the money's going because you'll get these huge discrepancies between movies that are heavily like. Um, either you know using some form of computer graphics that doesn't cost that much you know like so my question is yeah that's where a lot of the money is gonna go is is vfx but when you see something like let's say a mario cost significantly less even though it doesn't look worse than uh what was that movie with um chris evans uh that failed um oh, light year uh, light year yeah. yeah light year right but light year <laughs> it's half the cost though right it, it, it's half the cost or even i mean maybe you could throw in the godzillas of the world and it's like it's half the cost so i also wonder if it's funny money you know what i mean but i mean it's they're doing themselves yeah man, but i'm really i, I really no, i think you're i think you're right um, yeah, honestly like time. when you do the if you did a detailed audit of what's actually this money is spent on on an average movie uh, I think it'd be fascinating to see where the money actually goes because it cannot all be on VFX, mm -hmm. especially how they seem to be getting worse and worse as we go. And films like Godzilla Minus One prove that you can make a movie that's effects heavy. Yeah, I know they use a lot of models and practical effects and stuff, but there is a lot of CGI in that as well. And it looks, for the most part, really good. And it costs less than $15 million. It, it's insane. starting to yeah, it's starting to look really sus. Uh, and I've, so, I've wondered the same thing, Eric, because you see those huge budgets and then some of the quality is dog crap. One of the things that really started to make you question was the wheel of time uh, TV show adaptation. The sets look cheap. And I'm like, didn't this have like a massive budget? Amazon is behind it. Where is all the money going? And then I was like, I wonder if the showrunners and executive producers are just pocketing massive paychecks and not actually putting the money into production. Because how many executive producers were on Rings of Power? Wasn't there like an insane amount of just unnecessary kind of people that just seem to be jumping on? And of course, then you have those writing rooms that have like 10 writers on dog crap, like legitimate dog crap, uh, like She-Hulk. And they have a massive writing room and I'm like, D what is it just a massive room of idiots? Like, how could a group of people come up with something that bad? Uh, you'd usually think more brains on a on a subject would improve the quality. Well, apparently not. And so I think they're just getting massive paychecks. And uh, but hey, they got paid, so they don't give a crap. Um, well, that's what uh, I'm hearing. I'd like. I just want to say, when it comes to how money is actually spent on productions, productions are actually very tightly run ships. And in terms of there's no there used to be ways that Hollywood producers could sock away like the production of Die Hard 2 and Joel Silver and house renovations and things like that. But nowadays, every penny is accounted for. But the problem is, is that now, like on a Marvel film, when you're shooting everything against green screen or there's green screen, it means every single shot in a movie becomes an effect shot. And then that's yeah. farmed out to an effects house that has overhead and the effects house is employing people. So the, the effects that you're getting are incredibly expensive there, you know, you, you, and, and you're employing, if you look at the credits, like thousands of people. So there's tremendous overhead because everyone's working in a vacuum now. And the thing about Godzilla, I think what's really interesting about Godzilla minus one is you have a very tightly run company and our director of that film, he started out as an effects guy. He directed movies like The Returner. He directed uh, the space battleship Yamato, a.k.a. Star Blazers, live action feature film. He understands how effects are, are done. The same way that Peter Jackson understood how effects were done when they were making Lord of the Rings. So you had filmmakers that here that really understand how effects are employed and used. Nowadays, directors don't know F all about effects. 
They don't know anything about setting up shots. And you, I shouldn't say not, that's not true of everyone. But for the most part, studio product is employing people like at the director of the Marvels had no effects that's background. Right None. What background, what background is, at all is, did she have? Did she have a, an extensive experience in filmmaking? Period. Fan fiction. Yeah, she did. Yeah, fan I mean, fiction. she, she, she did. The, she did the Candyman uh, reboot, and like everyone's was, favorite. Yeah, I mean, everyone loved that. But it's like a low-budget horror movie. To go from that to a big-budget, effects-heavy movie, it was the same with Chloe Zhao when she had to do The Eternals. She had done low-budget indie films, and then suddenly she's helming like a two hundred and fifty million dollar ensemble cast action blockbuster. Uh, yeah, how are you possibly going to do that? And Gary said it right. Um, you know, directors are not um, hired anymore. They're cast. They're just there to fill a role like the actors. True. It's all mm -hmm. part of a, a bigger machine. And so most of the time, they're probably not even aware of what they're doing. I mean, Nia DaCosta said it herself about the Marvels. We were doing shots and I didn't even know what the fuck it was or what it was supposed to be for. You, you should not have a director making statements like that. This is this is not how films are supposed to get made. It's it's insane. And again, it's just part of the blow. It's a part of the complacency of just having a, a machine that people just slot into, and gradually that machine is just like falling apart because nobody's nobody's actually tending to it. No one runs it anymore. No one understands it anymore. It's Look, and, and this run. is why, to me, I think people are um, you know they need to start kind of maybe coming to terms. I think the comic book industry is finally starting to get around to that, but maybe it looks different. You know, maybe entertainment is just it's, it's, it is fundamentally kind of changing in how people are producing yeah. uh, its content. And, you know, when you are as big as they are, like with these mega corporations, multinational entities that are producing this, the, these movies, they don't have that ability to pivot. And of course, they're going to stick to what they know, even if it doesn't work, even and, you know, because they can sort of sustain those losses unlike anybody else. But when you look at kind of the trajectory of just Hollywood in general, it just I don't see how under its current infrastructure, if you will, it's going to get better. You know, like it, it like these movies are going to and I and I wonder, like, how long can they sustain the losses? Like, right. When when you're talking losing billions of dollars on streaming and then you're losing, um, you know, X amount of money, you, you know, the one place where you you could make money in your movies, you can't make money there. So I, I, I wonder, like, even for the c customers or consumers, maybe that maybe these companies have control of these uh, uh, certain properties. Maybe it's going to just have to look different. And maybe the in the industry, especially with Hollywood, is going to have to come to terms with how people digest or how people um, uh, uh, become customers of these various different types of materials is fundamentally changing. It is it, it is fundamentally changing and the economics as it stands right now just don't make sense and it's just not going to work well you know it's well, interesting and, oh go ahead oh sorry i was just thinking just what eric was saying here about it seems like they can't change it and i find it hilarious because you know Iger came out and says we're going to try and be less political and stuff right but then you hear about what their plans are for the upcoming x-men that it's going to be a female focused film yeah if you hear about what they were planning with blade you hear about what they're planning <laughs> with fantastic four and it feels like current disney even if their heads are, are trying to course correct and i don't really think they are i think Iger is just as much of an activist as he was before and he was just pandering uh to try and uh get investors not as worried but e even if they were trying to course correct there's it's too the company is too infected not just disney hollywood in general it's like a train that has massive momentum they're trying to slam on the brakes but it ain't stopping and there's a cliff on the edge because like you just see, I get the Ray movie coming out to Acolyte, like the crap sludge pipe of what they've been producing does not seem like it's going to be stopping anytime soon. We're still in store for some whoppers. Uh, I, I can't wait for the Ray movie. I need another 100,000 subs for my channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, it's it's going to launch more. Ray movie. The, the Acolyte um, is probably going to launch more YouTube careers. Um, and, you know, <laughs> Look, it's Disney you job career is okay. <laughs> they really are like they've they've started so much within YouTube, but um, yeah, the, you you mentioned the X Men reboot there. Um, I've actually there's an article here uh, about it on comicbookmovie.com. Um, mm -hmm. X Men reboot rumored to be female focused with Mister Sinister as the main villain. Um, so yeah, obviously they're not going to make official announcements until at least early next year. But uh, according to Daniel Daniel Rickman, the initial idea is to focus more on the female members of the team. 
Kevin Feige wants to make the movie different to the 20th Century Fox <laughs> franchise as possible, which means no Magneto for the time being, and probably oh. no Wolverine either. They you know, haven't learned the, 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 <laughs> the best <laughs> characters in the X-Men series, and yeah, you're not going to use them. Okay, great. What, what's say- so strange about that is the X-Men have always had great female characters. I mean, if you're a comic fan, uh, uh, the, for me, the X-Men are the comic version of Star Trek. I love the X-Men. You can't really see it, but beginning right behind me, I probably have $3,000 worth of X-Men omnibuses. I love the X-Men, and the X-Men have always had great female characters. Yes. It's been, especially in the Chris Claremont era, you know, Shadow Cat, Kitty Pride, Storm, Jean Grey. I, I, I mean, take your pick. But um, the, the problem, Robert, is that they're not the focus of the story at all times that's what that's what has to happen now in order to make it successful apparently like it's I, got to be female focused it can't just be a balance anymore it has i to mean be it's it's, it's so it's so strange to me because if you read the asgardian wars one at mirage who was a character in the new mutants she got really fat and when she went <laughs> when she went to and had to deal with her problem she got lost in the desert and, and walked her way into her great physical shape again I'm like, wow, it's dealing with modern issues <laughs> in, in very interesting ways. The X-Men have already done, I mean, in terms of representation in comics, the X-Men were 30 years ahead of the curve and they've dealt with it all. And it's just, it's amazing to me back in 2003 in X-Men X2. Well, can't you try just not being a mutant? I mean, if it wasn't yeah, already like, there. What, that, what is that a reference to? That's I wonder. 20 yeah, like, years ago. And that was in a movie of the x-men and if you go back and you read god loves man kills you go back and you read the dark phoenix saga i mean the x-men was doing progressive comics before anyone was even aware of it and they were doing it well yeah and it's incredible to me that people forget this it's It's the secret of good writing where like it makes you think about these issues but it doesn't force you to like see their point of view it's like okay you know you're you're allowing people to examine these things from a different perspective because you transpose it into a different setting and just allow them to just think on it for a while and make their own decisions. That's, that's good writing right there. That's almost like, like what Star Trek used to do as well. It was great. hundred yeah, percent. That line you just referenced. Have you ever tried not being, I'm pretty sure uh, Buffy's mum says, have you ever tried not being a Slayer to her in I think, <laughs> season two or something? Yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. these are people that were, were aware of what was going on. A, a long, long time ago. I mean, I, yeah. I I never thought I would say this, but one of my most gratifying moments, entertainment, like enjoying something that I I hadn't enjoyed for a while, was the Hellfire Gala 2023 issue of X Men that began the fall of X. I read that comic. I hadn't read a comic more than once, a new comic, until this year, and I read that comic over and over and over again. It was so satisfying. So many people died. So much stuff happened. I'm like, wow, I forgot what this was like. You and know, it was back, one comic book. Like back in the day, say in the 90s, if there was an announcement of a female focused kind of anything, right? That wouldn't, that would be uh, like for guys, I'd be, oh, really? Because, the, you know, back in the 90s, that they could do girl power right. You know, it would be fun. It would be sexy. It would be, it'd be made for the comic book fans and stuff. Where now, when you hear it, you know what they're going to be doing if it's going to be female focused. It's going to be the girl boss current tropes with uh, Karen kind of thing. And the fact that they're going to be perfect from the get go and they can't be challenged and they can't have vulnerabilities or weaknesses and having traditional femininity, that's going to be stripped. And, and that's the reaction now, which is kind of sad because back in the day, girl power was fun. Everyone got on board. Every, everyone liked it. It's funny you say that because like. on top of that, I was even kind of annoyed when they were like, Wonder Woman has proven that women can be the lead in a film or whatever. I was like, Talking about Wonder Woman. Uh, <laughs> this is that's on par with Jennifer Lawrence being like, yeah, oh, like it's so gratifying to be the first female action hero. I'm like, fuck off. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I miss the days of the Charlie's Angels films with Cameron Diaz dancing mm-hmm. in her Spider-Man under ruse. <laughs> no, like where I mean that's that's female led, no problem mm-hmm. with that. But but you've got the convergence of so many issues that Hollywood's dealing with. Um, one being that's ignored is the the big tech. Just coming in. Big tech has come into every industry and disrupted it. You know, like Kramer entering a room in a Seinfeld episode. Boom, they come in and say, hey, nice hotel business. 
you've got there. How about we make it more convenient and we'll take 30% of your entire industry. They did this to the taxi cabs with Uber. They've done it with um, food delivery. They've done it with uh, now streaming, right? I mean, look, when you look at the big streaming companies, they're big tech. It's Apple, it's Netflix, and all of these others are all these others are playing uh, catch up. Sony, in a smart way, has not. There's no streaming service for Sony, right? They've held back. They've held back quite a bit. But also, you've got the coming um, AI, which I don't know if you follow Justine Bateman um, on. She's social incredible, media. by the way. Yeah, she's been fantastic. Who would have thought? Great. Yeah, exactly, exactly. From Spy uh, Magazine's Just Seen Bateman <laughs> to AI Profit. Yeah, no, but she's been she's just been very insightful on it. But I think it's a losing battle, and I think it's made clear in this article that you know you you skimmed you skimmed through the the highlights, but the final paragraph of this article, uh, a drinker says, uh, "quote I'm bracing for when studios make a film and bypass the guilds using AI, which I think is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Guild agreements are there regarding the treatment conditions and payment for employees." Well, if you don't use employees and you just bypass them completely, guilds can't do anything about it. And it's going to happen. I'm telling you, there's going to be, there already it has, like indie film is always trying to break the model and remake the model, right? Independent film. Rob, you know a lot about that. You and I have had long discussions about independent film and how like, you kind of have to remake the business model each time to profitability and yeah. doing it on a low budget scale. But there are no rules with independent film with regard to AI. When you're first going to see it, I promise you it's going to be children's programming. You're going to see you know, cartoons for kids, and you're not and, even going to notice. That's, that's, and all, yeah, sorry, to sorry. your point, sorry, no, sorry, yeah, to oh, your please. point, Chris, about um, how you're saying big tech has come in and shaken up a lot of industries. I think one of the big differences with AI going to be shaking up a heck of a lot of industries yeah. is AI is suddenly far more accessible to everyone, and there's going to be a lot of independent creators that are now going to be able to ramp up production, ramp up scale, and suddenly going to be competing with the mainstream to a level that I don't think we've ever seen before. And I think some of the early iterations of AI content is going to be animation uh, related yep. stuff. Yep. And because uh, the amounts of, uh, I guess, um, workflow increase that, that AI can help out with animation is actually insane. It's, and that's something that I'm interested in exploring in the future when I have a, some more resources available because that's exciting for me. I like to think that I could make some larger scale animated content without having to lay out the resources to start a massive, or not even a massive, just even a small scale studio, the amount of costs involved boggle my mind. But now suddenly with more accessible tools, it's like, oh, that might be within my reach. That's really interesting. <clears throat> Well, it's all about it's all about process and creating that business model. I don't know if you, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know if you've seen the um, latest South Park episode, um, the one that dropped yesterday. That it's about is influencers. I it's have about seen influencers it. and OnlyFans, and it's adult themed. This latest episode is like there's a warning at the beginning. It's there for a reason. Full on dong. Um, you're going to see <laughs> in animated form. Um, but uh, what's interesting about south park a documentary worth seeking out is uh, uh it's called six days to air and it's how they created a process where they make an entire episode of south park in six days not everyone's a home run but because they've limited the number of voice actors um matt and trey for the most part do uh, most of the voices um they've they've got a small team it's very it's very tight they've created this business model where they can just crank episodes out. Uh, that episode's really worth um, checking out too. It's uh, on the level, may even be better than the Pandaverse episode, which I thought was fantastic. But AI is going to change everything, but you still need an artist. This is, Shad, I really enjoyed your um, demo, your demos. You're like the Dr. Frankenstein of, of AI. I hope you <laughs> It's alive. <laughs> yeah, it's great. But like, but um, it's, it's interesting because um, and, and I got to give script doctor credit for this. He doesn't call it AI. He says it's SI, it should be called SI simulated intelligence. AI is not intelligent. You need an artist in the same way that you mm -hmm. need someone like I can't, I, I can't do art, right? You could give me a brush. I'm not going to make something great. You can give me Photoshop. I can make a flyer for a yard sale. Yeah. But I can't do art, but I've seen people pick up a stylus and in Photoshop, boom, in five minutes, here is art that I made that is you know, right there, you know, quality of a Marvel comic. So you still need an artist to control the tool. 
It's just mm -hmm. a tool. So I think embracing it and then doing something that is, you know, made on a low budget level, but is, is could be a quality of a star Wars. Certainly <clears throat> um, the Disney plus star Wars shows. You could do that now using AI. Um, I could do that with seriously. a fucking pocket calculator. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. Low bar, low bar, but um, yeah. yeah, that's what's possible. Yeah. But you know, I, 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 one of the things about Hollywood that we saw this year too, which was really interesting, uh, the movie talked to me, the horror film talked to me oh, was yeah, made yeah, by, yeah. was made by two brothers who cut their teeth making videos for TikTok and YouTube. And they, they really learned their craft and uh, talk to me was was the example. It was their first feature, and it made me hark back to Spike Lee when he made "She's Got to Have It." Spike Lee, the legend is he, you know, he was selling shoes, he was selling uh, kicks, sneakers, whatever, and and he made money, and and he went and made "She's Got to Have It." Now I don't know if you guys have seen "She's Got to Have It," but it's a it's a great film set in Brooklyn, black and white, about a woman who has multiple boyfriends. Made in the eighties, he made it on his own terms. He made it with his own money that he earned. No one told him what he should do or what what it should be. He made it himself. And when it came out, it knocked it knocked the independent world on its ass because here was a man who came out of almost nowhere, brought a new vision, a new point of view to film. And of course, one more film later, he made School Days, but then he made uh, Do the Right Thing. His third film was one of the most transcendent. I think it was 89 that it came out. Yes, uh, one of the most amazing American films that to this day stands, I mean, with Rosie Perez dancing in the opening credits, I mean, that movie announced itself and, and Ernest Dickerson's photography, amazing work. Guy came out of nowhere, self-made. The directors of Talk To Me kind of did the same thing, but they learned their craft on social media. You would think that right now, and horror, by the way, Talk To Me did very well. Movies like Barbarian made for $4 million dollars made $40 million smile on a less than $20 million budget makes 200 million. That was going to go direct to streaming and they, it was going to go direct. So was evil to release it. So was evil dead rise. What, yeah. what, what Eric July did made his own comic went directly to the people crowdfunded it. I think what I would bet on is now with things like YouTube and, and worldwide distribution, you have creators, independent creators that, that call their own shots, going directly to their audience. And this goes back to the, the independent film boom of the late 80s. Spike Lee, Steven Soderbergh, led into Tarantino and Kevin Smith. Um, this is, I think, would possibly be the future because what you're going to get and what the, the drinker quoted me on saying was that creators, the authenticity of creators is going to be what people are going to respond to. AI is going to create a lot of cool stuff, but it isn't going to have a voice. I mean, you might have creators using it, but I think the authenticity of a creator's voice and the fact that you can now distribute directly to your customer base. Now, you might not be making a billion dollars, but you can make a good living and people are going to seek out the creators they trust the most. And it and doesn't this, cost you, it doesn't cost you $200 million to make right. your movie. No. And I think that that's what people are going to buy into. Whether uh, creators can use AI, but the problem with the studios is they've become inauthentic. You go back and you watch Iron Man 1. That movie is the movie about one guy having a crisis of conscience and having to learn. It's a character study of one dude. And at the end of that movie, it's not the sky isn't falling. It's, it's, it's Robert Downey Jr. fighting Jeff Bridges for the soul of a company and the soul of himself. That movie, why Marvel doesn't go back and look at that film? Why didn't they make the second Captain Marvel a reboot of Iron Man 1 and give Captain Marvel the same kind of personal crisis of conscience and not make a $250 million movie? Go back and make a $100 million movie and tell us a great story about a human being facing a, 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 a crucible that changes oh. their soul. But the problem is, is that that would mean Carol Danvers would have had to have been imperfect to have those flaws. <laughs> she yeah, she true. was perfect all along, you see. And uh, and if if we give you know this female character flaws, people might actually think we're saying women are, have flaws, and that's bad in the modern day. 
But you could Absolutely. never make Marvel could never make a movie like Iron Man again. First of all, man is in the title. Um, I think that that's that's <laughs> it's, straight it's up Iron Person. You can't now, do it. Chris. You can, it's <laughs> Iron person. Day. It could be Iron Day. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, you know, they can't do it because this was also previous to the era. I mean, that was made under Paramount, right? When Disney absorbs a brand, not only do they feminize a brand because Disney is a girl brand. Disney was built on princesses. Okay. You cannot, it's a girl brand. And so it should surprise no one that Marvel and Star Wars having been absorbed by the Disney corporation, um, that those brands have been feminized with. I, I, I want to, I want to challenge this a bit, Chris, Please, challenge. So, like, like, like most, I agree, I agree. I agree in part. But okay. some of the classic Disney Well, you're challenging stuff, him. I'm going to get myself a refill. Uh, uh, <laughs> some of the classic rant. Disney stuff has some great masculine elements in. Like, uh, is it Prince Eric in, in Sleeping Beauty? Sleeping Beauty, to me, is a boy's film about a prince saving a princess and killing a friggin' dragon. That film is is actually, like, to me, boss. Because I think Disney, when he was at the head, he understood some of these classic tropes. Yes, when, when Walt Disney ran the Disney company named after him, it was definitely a much more balanced general entertainment. This is entertainment for everyone. And Walt Disney was tapped into, and this is how you become popular on a mass scale. And there are filmmakers that know how to do that. Steven Spielberg probably being the most famous among them, that he somehow could tap into the zeitgeist. He knew working people, working class people, people struggling. Um, um, always a, a story of a fatherless household, which was relatable, especially at that time when that became a thing uh, in the 70s and 80s, right? So I, I, I believe that that, like, that era is over. And Disney is yeah, just, now just a soulless corporation that's bloated with middle management that is... Um, infected and taken over by um, people who are activists who are pushing pushing their idealistic utopian version of the planet with no connection whatsoever to real working people or families. For example, I'm going to say something really radical, but if you work for a cosmetics company, you might want to be a woman who wears makeup or a man who wears makeup, but you might want to use that product. And I kind of feel that um, the Disney company is just has a lot of people that just don't have families. And by families, I mean a, a, a traditional nuclear family, right? And they've lost the zeitgeist. And Rob, I don't know if we've had this conversation, maybe it was you and I, I'm not sure, about that Hollywood used to champion the working class. Yes. Used to, used to be a champion of the working class, where whether it was like a Clint Eastwood movie um, with uh, Clyde the orangutan, every which way but loose, any which way you can. Okay. <laughs> right whatever that. Clyde. Whatever you think of those movies or Norma Ray, you know, Sally Field, like the working class. Now the working class are not just vilified. They're treated with disdain, not just in 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 content that is created, but also by the very creators themselves. The way that you see um, this uh, this manager of a comic book store, the way he was treated by people. Oh, my God. And mocked and ridiculed for just saying, hey, I got a small business. I love comics, you know. You're, you're killing my industry. You're killing my store. I felt he was exactly me. right as well when he yes. said, like, yeah. writers can't yes. do anything except put themselves into the story because they've got no fucking imagination anymore and they're just narcissistic idiots. Yeah, right, right on the money. No wonder he caught so much flack because he was over the target. <laughs> right. Yeah, but you know, yeah. it's you, you see in, 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 in modern comics, I don't even know what it was. I don't even know what the comic was. I was I, It was a full page of somebody having uh, a text conversation on their phones, like two dudes having a text conversation. I don't even... I'm like... What the hell is that? <laughs> like, like if you're, if you're, I, I mean, I am surrounded. I have tens of thousands of pages of comic art and comic books here uh, of the last 40 years represented in omnibuses. And the reason you read superhero comics is, you know, you're, you're, you're the same reason that Greeks probably listen to myths about the gods. Um, you, you, you want to be transported and 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 it's wish fulfillment. Like, I wish I could be a character like this. You know, I wish I could have these powers. I wish I could save the world. You know, it's all wish fulfillment fantasy. But nowadays, I'm watching superheroes texting on their phones. And I'm like, okay, I understand. But, but that's not really, like, 
if I'm reading X Men, send me to the Mojo Verse, you know, mm-hmm. or 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 give me Long Shot, take me to Asgard, you know, take me in in front of who I want. I want to see Apocalypse. I want to go and read the Age of Apocalypse and see what my alternate versions of characters are. I mean, it's the entire raison d'etre of reading comics has sort of been lost, at least superhero mm-hmm. comics. A lot of no, great I... indie stuff, but mm-hmm. I yeah, remember just... Escapism. That was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, isn't that kind of the point? Yeah, yeah. Once upon a time, superheroes used to be these aspirational figures doing incredible things that would inspire us to grow and become better. And so, like, yeah, we can't get superpowers, but we would want to be like them in character and person and stuff. Where now it seems like people don't want to improve. In actual fact, they want to be validated in their own selves. And so they're bringing all the superheroes down to be like them. Instead of us becoming like the superheroes, they want superheroes to be these lousy people to be like them doing the normal boring things that people do in their lives because they want their self-validation. And that's kind of what I'm seeing uh, with what you're pointing out there, Robert. I just think... (laughs) I'm not optimistic like some people are. I think this shit's gone. This is done. Like it's like when we talk about Disney. No, I'm gonna be honest with you. Because we talk about Disney and the the rot that is kind of top to bottom. I mean, if we're talking about the comic book industry, that's what it is as well. Um, and to be fair, and I know people get mad at me when I mention it, it was always kind of on this house of cards. Um, uh, definitely with the big two. Um, uh, there's it's always been funny money. Uh, it's 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 needed to be subsidized. I mean, really, DC since its inception was was subsidized by other companies, right? That just, it just had to be because with the publication, there's just not a whole lot of money going around, and they're they're set up right now, such as um, like this whole direct market thing. It was illogical. It never made any fucking sense, um, and I think they're starting to feel the brunt of it. And you know, this is why you have these comic book shop owners finally coming to terms with like, look, man, I can't sell it because they're impacted by this whole thing. But to be completely honest, it was a charade all along, uh, if we're being honest. Ha- look, I, the way that I word it is Marvel and DC especially, they are the, effectively the sugar daddies of the comic book industry. They are the only ones that, that can sustain the losses it is that they that they uh, make. But you're, you're kidding yourself if you think off of that $3 comic, or for, they're like five now, I believe, $4.99, for a 20 page floppy open it up look at all the credits see the amount of names that are on it and understand that it has to transfer you're the fourth hand to get the get on the book when it had to get sold it was the publisher to the distributor to the retailer to you right so you have all these guys trying to eat off of those comics it was never sustainable to be completely to be completely honest and now that you're starting to see the parent companies have a, as much trouble as they are um, I think it's just gonna it's just gonna continue to trickle down, right? I don't know. Look, I would not be surprised if Warner woke up tomorrow and they said, "Look, we are the licensing this stuff, or the publication aspect of our business is just gone." As they start to like pinch pennies, I wouldn't be surprised at all. I wouldn't be surprised at all because they're not making money off it. There's no money uh, to be made uh, over there. But the reason why they lashed out at the comic book shop owner the way that it is that they are because they don't want to concede the point that maybe their ideological enemies were correct. The people that have been calling this stuff for what it was, especially since, I don't know, some crazy kind of happened uh, in 2016, you know, and everybody fucking went crazy, um, you know, but all new, all different Marvel that era up until now was calling it for what it was. They don't want to concede that maybe their enemies were right. Maybe they were right about the industries. And now, um, you know, people don't want to admit that. So like Mark Wade said, he'd rather the bitch burn to the ground. Right. Uh, then then ally with the quote unquote alt right. And everybody knows what he means by alt right is everybody to the right of Bernie Sanders um, that just talks about the issues that play comics. And a lot of the issues that play comics, it plagues um, modern entertainment uh, in general. And I just look. I think people need to start coming to terms with maybe in the next half decade, a lot of this, this, this stuff is just going to fundamentally change. And most guys aren't making it on the other side. There's no spot for them because they've been subsidized largely by mega corporations um, since they've been around. And we found a lot of guys in comics, especially trying to do the independent thing. And they're realizing, Oh shit, I'm not the draw. Mm-hmm. They like me when I'm yeah. writing Batman. They like me when I'm writing Daredevil. They like me when I'm writing Superman. But when I try to do my own thing, I, mm. I, I can't really get, I'm not really making that much that much bread. 
So this is a reality that I think people need to start making adjustments on right now because I think it's an inevitability. I just really do. And I'm all here for it. I say, you know, that like burn it all to the ground because they don't deserve, you know, to keep going well, if they're making crap. It's it's always that tough one of, yep, you brought this on yourself because if your attitude is so shitty that uh, you've essentially destroyed your own industry rather than admit that you were wrong, uh, you deserve everything you get. But the casualties along the way are all these characters and all these franchises that we grew up with and that we came to really appreciate and have an attachment to. You know, there's the comic book industry, there's the media side of things with, with all the big franchises like Star Trek, Star Wars, the MCU, all that stuff. Um, if if that's the casualties of this ongoing war, like damn, the victory is going to be pretty bitter at the end of it because like you've lost everything in the process. I say this, yeah, I know, but I, I say this really quick. Best case scenario, they run it into the ground, and someone that actually cares enough about it, which is really what, especially with comics, that's what's necessary right now. You need not Zaslav or fucking Iger, right? That's really kind of the head honcho of your company. You need someone that actually cares about it um, uh, to be a control of that, that property. Best case scenario for those that are like, yeah, this sucks. I like these characters. I grew up on these characters. They run it into the ground. If it goes up for sale and someone that has a little money that also cares about the product can get control of it. That is the, it's, it's, it's probably unrealistic, but that to me is the best case scenario out of this. Sorry. That's the absolute best case mm. scenario. For what, me, what I wanted, I, sorry, on you go. Okay. Well, the consolation for me, right, is that if everything burns down, we still have the classic great stuff that was made. That's that's going to be timeless. I mean, you know, they, they tried to desecrate Indiana Jones with this recent film. I'll never have to watch it again. It, to me, it doesn't exist, but I've got the classic Indiana Jones films that I can enjoy for my whole life, show my kids. And, uh, you know, part of me thinks like it would be nice to get continual stuff in the properties. Like, like wouldn't it be great to have a, a new Star Wars film that would be actually good. Yet I'm at a point right now where the stuff that people would be making is such an insult uh, to the great stuff that has been made, right? And when I say insult, they actually want to try and assassinate some le the legacy of these characters like Luke Skywalker, right? That I would rather nothing ever be made in Star Wars again if it's going to save, you know, these great legacy characters from being desecrated by these people that hate the properties, hate the fans. And, uh, and so that's why I'm like, yeah, let it all burn down. We've got the classic great stuff that we can enjoy for our the rest of our lives. Uh, rather than seeing it just continually be raped on the altar of ideology. That's what's kind of amusing that you're like, you know, I, I, I hope we can stop them from ruining Luke further. They're like, don't worry, we'll make a Ray movie. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, go for it. Yeah, make your Ray movie. <laughs> I, would, uh, I was wanting to talk a little bit about Aquaman 2, which has just come out. Just before I do, I wanted to read out just one or two little super chats that came in. Uh, one was from George the Giant Slayer. It was for $100. He said, all hail drinker. Here's a bottle for the holidays. Thank you very much, man. Uh, also, many thanks for the incredible review of Blue Eye Samurai. Just finished it. What a beautiful series. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it, man. So uh, cool. I, I certainly did. Uh, and he says, Merry Christmas to Drinker, Mauler, Chris, Eric, uh, Robert, and Shad. Um, yeah. Shout Thank out. you very much, man. Uh, yeah, Blue Eye Samurai really took me by surprise. I very much enjoyed it, and I would recommend yep. it to anyone. I've been um, hearing good things. I've seen the first three or four episodes, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, like it's pretty good so far. Um, uh, I've been told that it even ramps up after that. So, I, yeah, it's proof positive as well. You can have a strong female lead mm -hmm. as your mate, as your protagonist, and Whoa. they can be good, and they can actually be allowed to make mistakes occasionally and have flaws and an interesting mm -hmm. personality and an interesting backstory that explains why they are who they are. It's crazy, yeah. I know. And this came from Western writers as well. Like, it's a, a, a it's a joint French-American production. Um, and I think the French studio did most of the artwork on it, and then the, the American guys did the writing and, and um, voice acting side of things. Um, One of but the, it can work. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that intrigued me about the episodes that I saw is that they're actually showing this character that she needed to sacrifice her femininity for this kind of quest yeah. for revenge. And they're presenting that as a loss, as something, you know, that was that that's um, uh, you know, a regret for her character. I was like, oh, 
they don't usually do that. They're actually showing some nuance here for this female action kind of character. And usually uh, a lot of stories that have a female action protagonist don't even want to touch the fact, you know, that they are not as feminine as, you know, um, uh, regular women, basically. No, it's quite honest about the whole, like, because obviously in Japanese culture, particularly at the time, this is, uh, uh, you know, women can't do this stuff. They can't be samurai warriors and stuff. And so she has to disguise herself as a man to hmm. allow herself to do this. And, you know, like you say, it's it's pretty honest about her regret at having to do this. And it's not something that she enjoys. Um, and she's she's not this invincible like ray character who just beats everyone in her path like she gets absolutely fucked up in the course of this show like she gets stabbed strangled shot um beat, knocked unconscious multiple times like and she needs you know she needs help from other people at times that's a, a protagonist mm -hmm. going on a journey yeah. um yeah it's it's it is like funny how that works because um you're, you're with everything you're saying you're reminding me of arcane right like vi gets beaten to hell and back and it's just funny it's so counterintuitive like a lot of writers who are afraid to give women flaws or have them go through difficult things it's like you know it's it's really easy to adhere someone who has taken a beating and continues to get up it's one of the most obvious mm -hmm. things yeah. ever it's just like yeah it feels like we've been a writing 101 thing it's just like when someone is an underdog and they keep fighting we automatically like them <laughs> it's, exactly, it's like a cheat yeah. code in rose journey yeah mm -hmm. uh, one of the things is... that <laughs> oh go ahead I, I was just gonna say that one of the things people have forgotten is reality and i you know we watch these stories where where how people everybody wants to put their their own perceptions or their own ideology or their own whatever into their stories but what they're forgetting is the real world the actual uh, physics of the real world, the way the real world works, how people are constructed. And I find I find it such a weird thing that, like, if you look at James Cameron's Aliens, you know, one of the great things about that movie is uh, Ripley's power in that film comes from her femininity, literally comes from her ability to create life. It's She was a mother whose daughter lived and died while she was in hypersleep. And, and her entire motivation with finding Newt, she, and then she ends up confronting another mother, the alien queen, and her... So you're, you're dealing with two feminine entities that their strength is derived from something, their femininity, men can't have this. Men don't have this strength. Their literal femininity that, that only they as women it's a power that only they possess motherhood the creation of life and nowadays i mean cameron knew what he was doing cameron's a populist but 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 now if you were to do that people would say like well you know not just ripley can give birth and not just the alien queen i i think even cameron himself wouldn't make that film now like, yeah. probably not like he's but, not the james cameron that he was 30 years ago but the reality is that movie works so well, especially the extended edition when you see her cry. Yeah. I was supposed to be back for her birthday, her 11th birthday. Yeah. And when you realize she lived 57 years and died while Ripley was in hypersleep, the whole connection between a mother and a daughter playing off, that is so powerful. And that underlies that whole film. And when you, when you get away from her, you bitch. And you're seeing these two mothers. I can never be a mother, no matter what anyone says, no matter what. Well, Rob, I mean, we live in California. So it's <laughs> yeah. like, I'm just saying, yeah. when you watch <laughs> two mothers from different Careful species square off. I, I was going to say as well, that, just like, sorry. The film was uh, created to please even people like Shad. They had uh, Bishop saving Newt at the end there, representation for AI. So you see, so. <laughs> hey! <laughs> so thinking that far ahead was... <laughs> I, I was, I was going to say as well, just, just to like finish up on that Blue Eye Samurai discussion there. It was, um, there's an episode, I think it's episode six uh mm. where mizu has to she's sent into uh um i don't know how you describe it it's like a local fortress where um the local crime lord has got this um <coughs> prostitute and she's been taken from the local madam and she's uh the the main character has been sent in to deal with the situation and how can i put this she you think she's going to um find a way to get this girl out but she has 
uh, a broader view of the situation. And she knows that if I rescue her, this guy's going to um, just go for revenge and he's going to take it out on the, the brothel with all the other girls that are there. And I can't do that. And yeah, the, the show does not flinch away from the, the main character doing some pretty um, morally gray things. Uh, and I think that's, again, another thing I appreciated about this show. It doesn't always take the easy option. Um, she does some pretty fucking horrible things. Uh, and it doesn't always pay off either. Like, sometimes things can just go wrong, regardless of the tough decision that she made. And then you have to wonder, well, perhaps she could have done the right thing after all uh, if she wasn't so focused on what she was, um, what her end goal was. And I think that's, there's a real, there's a real moral ambiguity with a lot of the characters in this that I really appreciate. And again, you don't see it very often with, uh, with particularly with female leads. Uh, they have to be portrayed as what the writers think is morally righteous, even though in reality, they end up doing some shitty things anyway. It's just the, the film doesn't see it, you know? So it's, it's an interesting one. Um, but yeah, the, just before we go on, the other super chat that came in was from Casey Boyd, who says, since we have previous TV execs on the panel, I'm wondering how can Hollywood not see the massive growing audience and revenue from Japanese and Korean media and not want to follow that business model? The majority of the audience of Eastern media are Westerners now. Well, look, I mean, obviously anybody who has a... a Chris talks a lot about a media diet, a well-balanced media mm -hmm. diet. And I think Chris... I mean, we grew up watching movies from all around the world. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't understand. I mean, if you're a Star Wars fan and you've never watched Kurosawa, I would ask why. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't seen The Hidden Fortress, uh, uh, you, you would be shocked. When you watch Hidden Fortress, I guarantee you, first of all, it's a great movie. When you see the wipes and you see characters and you see shots in Hidden Fortress, you're going to be like, oh, my God, it'll change your life. But but uh, I think anyone who's an astute movie viewer watches films from around the world. Chris, you were championing RRR, yeah, uh, a phenomenal film. I mean, anyone who's gone to film school has to watch the Apu trilogy uh, that Criterion has out. And I think that one of the great things about the modern age is it's made cinema and art from around the world more accessible than ever. And it's fantastic because when you start delving into like what Korean cinema has done over the last 25 years has been astonishing. Whether you're watching horror, I mean, Squid Game, people are like, oh, or Parasite won Best Picture. But go back and watch movies like I Saw the Devil. Or if you like monster films, watch The Host. And then, of hey. course, Japanese movies have been killing it. French films, Italian films, Russian films. I mean, I have a great film from Africa made by these scrappy young filmmakers. I I think from Nigeria, called African Kung Fu Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, I have the German media book of this film that was made, I mean, made for not a lot of money by some African filmmakers, and it kicks ass. Mm. And if you want to see something funny and awesome, look for the trailer for African Kung Fu Nazis. Because it interesting? change your life. It's interesting though, because like the more Hollywood refuses to give audiences what they want, the more they're just going to turn to other, um, mm -hmm. you know, other countries that do. And this mm -hmm. is why you can have people watching something like Godzilla minus one. It's like a Japanese movie. It's all subtitled, and yet the the characters resonate with people over here just as much as they do in Japan, because like true storytelling, true character development, um, heroes within cinema. They resonate across borders and across languages. They are th mm -hmm. things that just appeal to humans on a deep, fundamental level. And if the cardboard cutout facsimiles of humans that Hollywood are giving us don't resonate anymore, we'll just go elsewhere. Like you say, you that's the great thing. Where it, yeah. that that cinema, that um, pool of different, um, you know products from different countries is now open to us and we can take advantage of it and it's about time and, oh, and what i love about it right is that um the fact that so many people are embracing you know we've done it for a long time anime has been around for ages and people have loved it right um uh, 
Asian martial art films. I friggin' loved as a kid and stuff. But even it's becoming even larger now. And Godzilla minus one. And what I love about seeing people like the, these foreign films to us being so successful it destroys that bullcrap narrative that has been getting pushed by the Hollywood and activists saying that you need people that look like you for you to be out identify with and feel represented and stuff like that. And which I find is one of the most racist notions. And it was pushed so heavily with Rings of Power. With, you know, now that there's a black dwarf, we can finally have, feel a connection in Lord of the Rings. And like, are you kidding me? You connect with people because they're people, not because they look like you. Uh, you know, people connect with Wally and he's a robot, right? And so I love that um, these uh, foreign films are doing so well. And if Hollywood was smart, yeah, they would pick up on, oh, you know, the foreign films are doing well. We could try and copy what they're doing. And they're, by the way, what they're doing is not that creative. They're doing classic traditional heroism and stories that people connect with on, on a human level. But Hollywood is too infested. It's the whole, you know, the, the train mm -hmm. has too much momentum. It's riding towards the cliff. And, the, and there's too many activists pushing it in that direction for them to stop anytime soon. Now, there was Hollywood a great is... quote that I saw about, um, it was relating to Lord of the Rings, but it was talking about the, the perception of characters in the original trilogy versus something like Rings of Power. And the distinction was great because they said Hollywood used to depict heroic actions. Now they depict heroic identities. And I just thought that is the perfect summation of their thought process behind all of this. It totally nails it. A quick, it's quick... Like you... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry uh, Drake. No, you got to finish your thought. Sorry. No, that was pretty much it. So okay. I, oh, so I just want to point out that um, uh, Godzilla Minus One is such a hit. In Japan, they're releasing it again, but it's Godzilla Minus One Minus Color. And it's a black okay. and white version. I yeah. put in, in our um, Twitter conversation, I put a link to the trailer that just came out um, of it's it's it looks spectacular. I mean, it's reminiscent of the very first 1954 Godzilla film. I put a, I sprinkled a couple other things in there. You may want to discuss for future open bars, including Netflix just released all of their numbers publicly. I saw that. Yeah. They it's 18,000 shows. Um, and you see the exact viewer rankings. Um, it's pretty spectacular. It's like, basically they just, they basically in a dick measuring contest with every other streaming service whipped out their <laughs> dick and just said, now let's see yours. They said that to Disney plus and everybody else, but you look at those numbers. I mean, I downloaded it. You're going to need to, you're going to need some, someone to analyze it. There's too much data to take in, but that's, that's how data comprehensive Netflix is. Whatever you think of that company, I think, you know, they've got, they, they, they're for everybody. So there's going to be stuff on there that you probably don't like. A lot of things that could be questionable, but there's also really great things. Well, as well so, yeah, well, and they've brought it. they've brought the world. They have yeah. movies and series from all over the planet, yeah, which is a positive. And Netflix is a bit bizarre for me in that regard because, yeah, they have like absolute degenerate crap like Cuties and Big Mouth. Right, right. Yet then they also bring us Arcane uh, and uh, and the adaptation of One Piece, and it's uh, and yeah. uh, one that I've been watching recently is the live action Yo Yo Hakusho show if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yu Yu Hakusho? Which is, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And that's an anime adaptation. Yeah, it just launched. And I'm not too familiar with the anime. I'm up to episode three on Yo Yo Hakusho, and it freaking kicks ass. It I'm really kicks enjoying it. ass. I it's think this, so is the, this is the thing, though, because, like, you know, as with any platform, they, they try to have as broad a range of content as possible. And so, yeah, there's inevitably going to be absolute garbage on it, but there's also going to be good stuff. And it's just up to us to sift through it and find the good stuff amongst mm -hmm. it. And I don't necessarily blame them for having shitty things on there. If like all they produced was crap, like Disney Plus, uh, right. I would have an issue yeah. with it. But it's like they're just a platform to host most of this stuff. Well, so it's kind Netflix of... are known for green lighting projects that are insane and terrible. Well, there is but, that, yeah. You know, like they could probably do better, but I'm with you on the whole, like we're, they are bound to have terrible shit on there. But should I mean, we, I wouldn't uh, give him a pass. Should we see a little bit of the trailer that Chris referenced? Because I've got it here. I can I can show you just sure. a little. Because I don't know if it's going to like hit me with copyright or whatever. Right, right. But let's try it. Let's do it. But if you could I just... love that woman. <laughs> yeah. If you slap a bit of film grain on there, I would be happy as Larry. Uh, you know, I think it still it still looks a bit too clean because obviously it's high def modern stuff. But yeah, a bit of grain, and I would be I'd be pretty happy with that. It does look good. 
Um, it really gave kind of the reminiscent vibes of the original black and white Godzilla there yeah. with some of those shots. Oh, yeah. So I can see why they did it. I just love that they kept the theme tune in. That that iconic theme is so good. It's so sinister. Um, but yeah, I know we're about an hour in. I haven't even talked about any of the things I meant to put in the title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people like, when are you going to talk about Aquaman 2? <laughs> yeah, let's do it now. Let's do it uh, now. So I've seen uh, Aquaman 2. Chris mm -hmm. has seen Aquaman 2. No one else has. So um, we can, I, I guess we can give you a lowdown on it. And I'm not going to labor it too much because I know it's kind of boring if you haven't seen it. But we won't go into too many spoilers. I guess we can just give you a high level view of the movie. How does that sound? Sounds Go good. And you know, you say I haven't seen it. If I wasn't needing to review it, I would not see it because <laughs> it looks I would either. like crap. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, oh, how can I put it? It's very much just like, it's like uh, Blue Beetle. It's like um, uh, Shazam 2. It's like Black Adam. It, it's essentially like a pretty inoffensive, bland, generic comic book superhero movie that's really I don't know. what it with, is with those films it sounds like an absolute crap if you're if it's like those ones kind of yeah like it doesn't you don't get that weird like like sinister pandering feeling that you get with the marvel movies it's not trying to lecture you about the evils of being a white man or anything it's it's more <laughs> just like um there's actually quite a nice theme of family and um fatherhood and stuff at the core of it which is kind of okay i guess um it's just the implementation that's the problem. It's you can tell nobody's hearts really is in it. Uh, it just feels like a film that was made to fill a release schedule. No one seems to care that much about it. Like um, Jason Momoa seems pretty checked out most of the time. Um, the CGI looks okay, I guess. Um, the 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 interplay between him and his brother is okay. Like that's really the the main thrust of it so just to give you context like black manta from the first film is back he wants to take revenge against aquaman uh, and so he uncovers this ancient device in antarctica because there's always an ancient device and it's found because global warming um and uh, it behind it is like a link to like this uh, evil ancient power that tried to like take over atlantis and so he wants to like release all of his people and like come back into the world because they've been sealed away for centuries under the ice. Uh, and so he's able to like communicate through um, through this trident, uh, this this evil device uh, with Black Manta, um, give him like more knowledge, give him more power so that he can fight Aquaman. And in return, he wants to be released upon the world. Um, and Part of the guy's plan is that they're going to burn off all these um, chemicals that the the Atlanteans stored away. It's like basically fossil fuels, the equivalent of fossil fuels, uh, to heat, heat the planet, melt the ice caps, release all the evil demon guys that are trapped under the ice and take over the world. And so Aquaman has to recruit his brother to help him out um, to stop this guy. I mean, stop me if I've missed anything, Chris. <laughs> like, uh, you you might have it. you might have spoken longer about it than it's even worth. But um, I'll, I'll give you a, a, just a couple things because I know there's a lot of people asking for certain pieces of information. Yeah, yeah. There's one I need to know, guys. Yes. Is Amber Heard in this to a lot? Yes. Of yes. She's not ah, only she's not only I in can... it, she's in it a lot, and she's in it for about twenty minutes. But like, it's ten minutes at the top, and ten minutes in yeah. the final act. And here's what's weird is. She barely speaks in the movie. She gets this injury that goes across her neck from Black Manta, and she's she's you know in the she's in a whatever underwater hospital recovering uh, for most of the film, and she doesn't talk. So she's in the movie twenty minutes and has like six lines in the whole film, which is really weird. The other thing is, yes, Aquaman's son uh, son urinates in his mouth twice. Um, the other thing yeah. is, I would say that this movie, there were parts of it I'm like. Why, like, I know this is dumb. It is literally the worst script for any DC movie ever. And it is, you were, Drinker, you were dead on. It's like, it's sort of inoffensive. And it doesn't come burdened with, one, the Marvel checklist of things you have to do in a movie or you can't do in a movie. The other thing that is kind of positive about it, you do not even have to have seen the first Aquaman. You don't have to see seven Disney Plus series or no, have a knowledge of this. It's like, hey, there's a guy named Aquaman. He talks to fish. He has powers. 
That's all you need to know. It is, it is for me, and Rob is going to get this. It is, it is a two hour episode of Super Friends from the 70s and 80s. Oh my God. And I'm not, I'm saying for good or bad, it's Super Friends. That's all it is. And they even at the beginning of the film, they do this sort of, which is a complete ripoff of um, Thor. It's a complete ripoff of um, Ant Man 3, where it's like, hey, I'm Aquaman. Here's my life. I yeah. got a son. I got a, they do the whole, I, that's, we've seen that in like three other movies, right? But then he's, he's talking about battling certain, uh, being involved in certain battles. And he's talking to his son and you see him literally taking action figures and going like this, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a super friends live action. Now, James Wan, who I, I think, you know, James Wan, I don't know him. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, he's one of the nicest guys in the world. Right. And I, I will say I was on the set of the first saw shooting behind the scenes uh, interviews uh, at Lacey Street Studios. But uh, he's he's constantly delivered. You know, he, yeah. he 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 went back to his roots and did the first Insidious movie for like nine hundred thousand dollars and it became a huge hit. I mean, James Wan is the spirit of independent film that transitioned and made Furious 7. And now he's doing, you know, he made a billion dollars with Aquaman. So he's lived in both worlds. Yeah. And, and, and um, also uh, involved in a lot of horror, other horror properties as well yeah. uh, via, via Blumhouse. I mean, but, the, the entire conjuring verse at Warner brothers. Yeah. It's made them a ton of money is all James Wan. Yeah. And it feels very yeah. indie, but with this, I just feel like, um, the seven-year-old version of me that used to watch Super Friends on Saturday morning when it was the only day um, that you could get like a full like hours and hours of cartoons in the morning, right? It wasn't like this constant, you could just click and see whatever. Um, the seven-year-old of me was like, oh, this is like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. I'm kind of having a good time. If you're, a, you're an adult and you actually use a brain cell or two and watch it, it's incredibly stupid. And uh, I don't even know if it's worth e-fapping for you, Mahler. It's just, it's just, <laughs> it's, but there's, but it's there's, nice thing. Burger. <laughs> but look, there's like these giant machines. It's, it's like, how can we just, there's a character named Kingfish that is basically Jabba the Hutt with a bunch of like yeah. sexy fish women with huge fish tits. Mm. Hashtag fish tits. There, there's um, literally, yeah, because there's a I'm line from Aquaman, like where he says, you can't trust this guy, he's got blood on his hands. And then he just starts laughing maniacally because he's just like a fish and he goes, I don't even have hands or feet. And he's like holding his flippers up. Oh. It's, it's the script oh. is in, incredibly stupid. It's it's incredibly stupid. But it's also like James Wan is like, you know what? I just want people to have fun. It also feels quick in the sense it's like just two hours. And um, you don't miss Amber Heard, believe me. I mean, she's just, it's so weird how <laughs> you, she's- You can, no shit. You yeah. can, it, it's it, like, Chris is exactly right. Like she feels like, it feels like the movie's gearing up to have her be a big presence in the narrative. Cause she's like the mother of his child and stuff. And it's like, okay, it's like she's a big component of his family dynamic. Then yeah, she just gets randomly in the middle of a fight, fucking blasted with a laser beam right in the chest and knocked against the wall. And then she just vanishes from the, the movie from the next hour. She's just not in it. And you can tell <laughs> she was just edited the fuck out of that <laughs> film. Like she was doing lots of stuff before that. But and then she is... comes back and like you say, she barely talks. Right. She barely talks. And right. I think what you're seeing on screen is a fucking AI of Amber Heard. It's not even uh, her. Oh yeah. Could be. No, it's weird because she's present in many of the events events in the beginning and the events in the third act. She's present, but she doesn't talk, so it feels like she's not there and she's not really doing anything of consequence. So, but and I'll say though, the character of Black Manta is a decent villain, which is something they've always had a problem with a decent <clears throat> villain. So, look, it's a stupid Super Friends cartoon from the '70s made live action. If that's what James Wan was going for, you achieved it. But it's and, and and I like the fact that it's not connected to anything else. It's a self-contained movie. Yeah. You don't even need to see the first Aquaman or need his origin. It, that's it. I mean, it's it's and once you see something that's dumb, don't worry. There'll be something twice as dumb in the next scene. You, you uh, know what the, the funny thing is, right? And I don't know why this keeps happening, but like I keep watching these DC movies. And uh -huh. I keep seeing them failing spectacularly and making like, you know, negative fucking $200 million. But I'm like, 
I kind of like you more than I like the MCU movies. Now. <laughs> I don't Same. know why. Because yeah. you're not being lectured. You're not being lectured. Yes. There's that's not some it. like, like you, the, the Marvel movies now are predictable. They're so predictable because he's like, well, that person's not going to die. This woman's going to do this. This guy, you know, they're going to rip the balls off Fury. Like everything is predictable. We know what they're going to do because we know what what uh, message they're pushing. DC's not particularly in this movie, especially with James Wan, not pushing any particular message other than, as you pointed out, drinker family, which I think is a very good message. And also to dispel another rumor, they don't kill Aquaman's son. He's in peril, but they don't kill a yeah. baby in the movie if you were concerned. So just to dispel a lot of the things that have been floating, floating around out there about <laughs> Aquaman <laughs> and the Lost Kingdom. I had to say it. I had to say it. Yeah, these, these movies feel like they were made in like the mid-2000s. That's yes. the vibe I get from them. And it's just their their downfall is just they're a bit shit. <laughs> it's like <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> you know. So true. I, I don't oh. know. Yeah, and the, the sad thing is like it's gonna spectacularly flop. Of course it is, because no one's gonna care about these DC movies now. And it's just it's a sad end to the DCEU. This well, is I, it. I think what's really shocking is now we have two films that came out basically within a month of each other that are follow-ups to billion dollar grossing films and and if there's any indication of of hollywood's dysfunction is how do you take a movie that grossed and by the way there's i think there's less than 60 films of all time that grossed a billion dollars how do you make a sequel to a billion dollar grossing film that didn't just make half of it but like like 75 percent less than the original yeah. i mean this is something i think this might be unprecedented in business history well it doesn't and, signify the change i think again i think it all goes back to things just look different now and um yes you ha I, I get it like with the whole Bar Barbie thing and Oppenheimer, I just I just think those are outliers, man. Um, and I guess you think about it, a billion dollar film, I guess in Barbie's case, that, that should be an outlier. Like it's not anything that's going to happen all the time. But I mean, to your point, these are like colossal failures. It's one thing for it to be. Yes. Yeah, not a billion dollar film, but it's another to lose. Like in the case of the Marvels, how much money did that film lose? Like damn near half a billion dollars. Like give or take, close. I, 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 yeah, I would think so. But like, that's, that's, you know, the budget was three hundred million. Advertising, one hundred and fifty. But uh, like but I think to your point, to your point, Ripa. I mean, Eric. I, I here's what I, which, which blows me away. A billion dollar grossing film has something to say. You can look at that film if that's the only thing you're looking at and analyze it. In case of Captain Marvel, people say, well, it's between Infinity War and Endgame and all that. But still, it did provide a solid tale. Mothers and daughters love that film. And then you go to the Marvels. I mean, this, this failure of understanding by the powers that be is a catastrophic business failure of people that don't even understand their own product the same mm. is true of Aquaman. i love james wan he's a I, I think he's a great guy and a great filmmaker but this film was delayed a year it was supposed to come out a year ago and it's like look i love the first aquaman it was goofy fun you had armored sharks fighting dudes on armored seahorses and i was like wow i felt like i was eight years old watching jason and the argonauts again and the fact that this film um, has, with all of the people that had oversight over this, that it's this catastrophically a failure, there's something really wrong <laughs> with the people making decisions. What's the budget, I mean, what's the budget officially for, for Aquaman? Do we know? Oh, I'll bet it's, it's for, closer. For, it's 200 I million, I think. Okay, wait. Uh, I question. think it's more than that. Uh, Drinker, do you think if this had come out in place of Aquaman 1, that it would have made like significantly less money than Aquaman 1? No. I think, yeah, I I think it would have been close. Because one of the things that I think has really happened, and, it, and it's the result of continual dog crap that uh, Hollywood has been spewing out, is that they've lost the benefit of the doubt. Back in the yeah. day, yeah, yeah. if something was coming <clears throat> out that it was in the MCU, I was going to watch it and I before even reviews. 
I and just think about that. That was me making a gamble, knowing nothing about the film, that I was like, I'm watching, I'm there, no question. Right now, it's the exact opposite. Anything coming out from Disney or anything, my first default is I am not even gonna glance at it until I hear good stuff from it, if it's worth my money. And just think about that massive shift in mentality, because I think that's representative of a lot of moviegoers. Oh, they lost the normies, there. right? That so, was their, yeah. They, yeah. They, they had already kicked out, I mean, the diehards, but yeah, they lost the normies. Once they lost the normies, that, that, that told them, I mean, the writing was on the wall. There was nothing that they could really do. Like, you can't just crap out a successful film, which is really what they, they were on the streak where that's what they could do. Even if it didn't make a billion dollars, it was going to make some money. And and it, again, they're not just losing money. Like this is, again, the, the the amount of money that they're spending versus the return that they're not getting. Like that, that stuff hurts, man. Uh, that that that, that yeah. like again to lose like almost I'm talking four hundred, five hundred million dollars. Like to, that that's just a straight up ale. Like you you, there's no recouping that. Like for the most part, it's that's rough, man. And we're seeing movie after movie after movie do it. And in the case of Disney, they do it back to back to back. Boy, they better thank. I mean, it, I mean, it, I guess they can thank themselves. But if they didn't have those damn parks, man. Yeah, to to expand on your question more, like I think if this movie had come out in twenty nineteen, like a year after the the first Aquaman, this would have done a billion dollars as well. I'm yeah, not, sure. um, not to be yeah. uh, well, disagreeable uh, or anything. The the reason I bring it up is because I thought the first Aquaman was fucking dreadful. So that the idea yeah it was yeah. Some, <laughs> yeah. Like, well like yeah. somehow like like Come when you've got on. that momentum <laughs> somehow behind the character like clearly there was hunger for more Aquaman movies and if they had released this then to capitalize on that momentum yeah I think it would have done a billion dollars it wouldn't have deserved it but it would have done it <laughs> okay yeah. here's the other question then what if Aquaman one had come out in place of this would that have suffered greatly do you think? I think yes. so because they again they've lost the benefit of their doubt. Back in yes. the day, they could put out dog crap superhero movies, but because it was like kind of in between some really great ones, they would do what like Iron Man three is trash. All right, but it's kind of when there was a lot of momentum, and I can't even remember how how well it did. I think it was uh, <laughs> doing better than the current stuff. That was um, a million dollar movie. A controversial take. Well, what, I just Iron I just Man three. Wanna... <laughs> I just yeah, want to say, like Rob, Rob, you were showing off your Jason Momoa one six scale action figure. <laughs> a I've got my a custom. A I've custom. got my Amber Heard mug. So there you go, right there. <laughs> the Amber Heard mug. Is that, that's clearly Doctor Who's unit, right? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Now, you look, say? here's the thing. I, I'm going to be a staunch Iron Man, Iron Man, uh, Aquaman defender, okay. because to me, again, it was a throwback to a time when I walk. I couldn't believe what I was watching the overt explosion of fantasy elements. There was nothing set in the real world. I loved it as a fan of Harryhausen's stop motion fantasy growing up. And, and it really made me think of Jason and the Argonauts and the stop motion battle with the skeletons. Of course, no one knows what I'm talking about now, but I but, do. But, and I, I remember the fight okay. against Talos. That was okay. You know, terrifying. you know, I mean, I, 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 and, and clearly James Wan was channeling that idea and that battle at the end of that movie, I sat in an IMAX theater before it came out watching this going, I can't believe this movie got made. And I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, does it, is it is does it fit with our age probably not <laughs> but but for me chris was talking about a a, a a super friends cartoon from the 70s which by the way were an hour long um i felt that iron man one was a stop motion ray harryhausen epic from the late 50s early 60s and that's why i liked it yeah rob rob you're gonna find if you can tap into the child in you that used to watch those early cartoon shows when there was very little superhero entertainment now just like there's so much we're just we're all over it <clears throat> I, I also put in the private chat i don't know if you want to crystalia did this comedy bit that's kind of blown up about marvel movies that um i showed on my show i don't know if you guys have seen it maybe something to look at later drinker um, to show Are you for sure you put it in the private chat no no, no not the private see. chat sorry i put it in the twitter <laughs> thread the Twitter oh, okay. thread. Mm. Uh, but um it's just that like i think that chris d'elia whatever you think of him as a comedian i know he was canceled for whatever um uh but like you know it, the the normies as you pointed out eric 
they're onto it. They're like, we're done. I don't need, I don't want to be burdened with, you know, having to have seen so many things to understand what's happening in the right. Marvels. So Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom being, you know, just not connected to anything that you really, it's not even connected to Justice League or anything. And there are no other heroes that are referenced or even discussed in the film. Like no Superman, no like Batman or like what's happening in Gotham City, nothing. It's all contained in the world of Aquaman, which I think was a smart choice, but too little too late. I mean, this movie's going to bomb worse than the Marvels, especially if you look at like the theaters, they're, they're empty. They're all yeah. empty. No one's going to see this. And it is a shame in some ways because I know I would rather watch this movie like five times over than watch the Marvels again. Like Same. Once. Same. There were parts I had a good time, you know, with those big mech underwater mech things they had and some of the creature designs. And um, But it is it is just this. For me now, the, the superhero genre is at that point where it's reverted back to where it was 20 years ago where yeah. people who are mm-hmm. into comic books who are into these like superheroes and they're fans of particular guys they're still going to watch these movies but like the normies have moved away now they're bored of it and they've moved on to other things See, and i don't know I, I think they've even pushed away hardcore fans that you know mm-hmm. like there's so many people that were diehard star wars fans that are not even going to touch the star wars stuff coming out now because of uh, the insult and and just desecration that they did to these properties. Mm. And so I think it's even worse. I think it's worse than what it was back then. Well, I yeah, do I think that we're always one we're one film, we're one great film away from the revitalization of a franchise. You know, one great movie can can uh, Well, I mean, well that that's look, what I'd ask Look at you, House like, of the Dragon. Look at House of the Dragon. That kind of revitalized. Well, I think know, when it comes to movies that's you might a limited need to... franchise though cuz you had Game of Thrones and you got House of the Dragon. It's like literally two things Mm -hmm. that's all you got but like with mark like say marvel for example if they like i don't know say deadpool 3 was fucking incredible and like we just all had a great time with that is the mcu now going to come back to its former glory i mean no but also look at the examples of um guardians 3 many people describe that as great i didn't think so but Mm -hmm. at the same time many people felt like oh that's another fantastic one didn't make a dent in uh superheroes Mm -hmm. like as a whole crashing and burning i don't think if the MCU was to truly be revived, how many great movies would it take? Truly great is like I think it might be three, and it might be in a row too. Yeah, like you have, one of well, them would have yeah, to be but, an Avengers movie. That's <laughs> but you're be. right, you're right, Mahler, because that's a the, the thing is the MCU has given us uh, <laughs> a lot of movies. <laughs> we're deep into <laughs> yeah. we're deep into. Uh, I think of all the franchises, I mean whether think about bond i mean there's only 25 official james bond movies and i think the mcu is 10 movies beyond that in half the time not including and the Disney plus shows no no we don't even include yeah. those things and star yeah. wars too but i but i do think what these companies what's interesting to me is you have corporate entities that have bought these franchises star wars i mean remember people forget the mcu started at paramount and then it went over to Disney. And and what I think the real problem here is, is that once a corporate entity owns something, um, they don't understand that there's good and bad Star Wars. They only know that there's a brand, the way Coca-Cola is a brand. No one thinks, well, this Coca-Cola thing doesn't work. I mean, even though Coca-Cola tries, they have an, I They released an AI-generated uh, Coke this year, believe it or not. Was only okay, but um, I tried it. Shed's all over it. But the hang on, is, hang on, hang on. In my defense, I like good AI art. There's a lot of sludge <laughs> and crap out there. It's, it's yeah. true, but 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 the thing is, like a, a corporation does not delineate between good and bad Star Wars. It, it doesn't have the apparatus to do so. They just think Star Wars. We bought Star Wars. It's a brand, and if it sells or not, they don't know why which is part of the problem of the upper echelons of Wall Street doing business in something that's essentially the arts. Because there's nothing on spreadsheets that accounts for good and bad storytelling or art. And that's where we're at. That's the problem that we're... You can't you can't throw money at a bad pro, a problem where <clears throat> writing or the people writing it is bad. They look at a spreadsheet of people 
and how much they made in their previous product uh, projects. And it's, oh, well, let's hire one of them and they'll make our product better based on their projects. It doesn't work like that, but corporations don't know it. And that's the problem we're at now. Hollywood is no longer art and commerce. It's just commerce. And they don't understand the art part of it because it doesn't, you can't, you can't spreadsheet great storytelling as much as people want to. I mean, Hollywood seems to think like a success is not a good film. A success is a film that makes money. And so they, th they thought, like, honestly, I think, a lot of them thought, you know, if we uh, push this more progressive woke messaging in film, that'll increase uh, the, you know, the accessibility of our product and make people, more people like it and be more profitable. But they're not learning from it now. Now that doesn't seem like they care about profits and because they're being infested by ideologues who want to push the message. Which has never been a part of storytelling anyway. So it's funny that that's something that people want to focus on. It's when the money, like when you've got so much money involved, I suppose that is what they focus on now. It's weird. Well, I think they they almost felt like they couldn't fail, you know? They probably think a lot of the Marvel stuff that they made, I get the feeling the higher ups, the executives, don't like any of it, even the great stuff. They probably think, you know, Infinity War is just superhero crap that nerds like, right? And so... I don't think they understand what actually made a good Marvel film, a good Star Wars film and stuff. It's just all crap to them. And they felt like, well, the normies, the nerds, they're just eating up this dog crap anyway. So we can just feed them dog crap with our message involved and they'll keep consuming, consuming it. I, I, I and think, they realize it doesn't work. Well, I think in the case of Marvel, a lot of people point to Ike Perlmutter being forced out as the point where the MCU started to decline, because that's when Kevin Feige had free reign to control everything. And it started to come out that, I guess, Kevin Feige is not the creative genius that he was built up as. And when you don't have someone like Perlmutter there to hold him in check and keep some of the, the message out of things... Uh, this is what you end up with, and it's not great. And yeah, that's, uh, I, I guess, part of the problem that they had. I mean, um, and it seems like, I'm not sure how much of a revolutionary he was. He just seemed like he had understood some real basic common sense things, like girls don't buy action figures. It shouldn't take a genius to kind of understand yeah. that. There's a vein of truth in, the, in that being said. But, oh, that's misogynistic. we got to get rid of him to realize, oh, what, there's a... Can, as a consuming difference between men and women and men consume more often predominantly one type of thing and women, but no, that's problematic. It's got to get out. And I just find it interesting how simple you actually need things to be to get it to be successful, like traditional classic heroism. Yo Hakusho has a really simple line in it that really elevates the show for me. I think it's in episode three where the character simply is trying to learn a new technique and is not giving up. So there's one simple positive thing that we already kind of mentioned. The characters that never give up, even in the face of failure, that's endearing. It's such a simple like, plot device to use that can really elevate a show. And then the character, he voices his motivation. He says, a man who can't protect the things he cares about isn't a man at all. It's just a simple little truth that actually resonates a lot with a lot of guys. It's a it's a line of classic heroism that lifts the show a lot. And it shouldn't be hard to understand. But it seems like it's still beyond so many people in Hollywood. Well, it's almost like uh, because we've had so little of this for so long now, like the classic storytelling, the simple hero's journey, it's almost like everyone is now primed and ready for it to come back. And when people start doing it again, it's like, well, okay, you've got a whole new audience that might have been a little bit bored of it uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Now, because they don't get it anymore, it's like, yeah, we're ready for it now. I don't know. I, that's me playing like 4D chess with Hollywood, which clearly they're not doing. But yeah, <laughs> I think once you've seen that they double down as many many times as they have, I think that's enough for I think people got to be realist about it and just understand that they are committed. To the retardation. That's just the, the, the bottom line. There's Sheer no other determined way. retardation. Yeah, they're they're, they're committed to it. Um, because when you, it's one thing to make a mistake and then make it, you know, okay, maybe even a second time, but to do it over and over with multiple franchises, it tells you how committed it is that they are. And and you know, to everybody's point here, I, I do believe that 
audiences are ripe right now for in all facets of entertainment that type of uh, a story being told. I just don't think that it's going to largely be. Let's say this. If there is to be a creative renaissance, which I do believe can happen, it's just not going to come from the mainstream. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just don't think they have the capabilities of doing it. I think everything that we see will be a, a, in isolation, but they just don't. Uh, you know, you bring up great points that the fact that, you know, they are tied to these mega corporations and the people that are in charge don't really even like this shit. Uh, like the guy that like Taika, Taika Waititi. I mean, he is such a yes. interesting ca character in that he can flat out say he's not into this shit and, and be a director of a, a franchise. That's remarkable to me like that. But, you know, it's it's that's par for the course in the same respects. I think that's what the industry is. It's a bunch of people that don't actually like this stuff. And in fact, they're very, very spiteful. Uh, I mm -hmm. think that we spoke about it a little bit earlier. When you talk about the like the bastardization of these these uh, legendary characters that are really a part of like American culture at this point, like Batman and all these these characters transcend comics. Um, and when you watch a, a film or read a comic book and you see that they just they're not themselves, I think these the, the creatives using that term very loosely are just so spiteful that mm -hmm. they're going out of their way to do that type of thing. There's something wrong with what yes. exists. Like the hell for that said the bit the, the the Snow White chick, right? Um, I know she's kind of changed her tune as of late, but when she comes out, it's like, hey. That that the old film was weird, and you know that like that. The prince is a stalker who saved the princess's life, but now is reduced <laughs> yeah. to being right. A stalker. But no, get what it is that she's. She, this is your your star, like actress, essentially saying she's not into this shit. Like it, it's not like mm -hmm. that, that's remarkable to me. But I think that's really the theme here with with Hollywood. It's a bunch of people that don't actually like it. They want it to represent where it is that they what it is that they view, but they're not really into the properties. It is that they now have, have control of. And that's why I think yeah. that if there is to be a creative renaissance, it's just it's going to come from they, independence, they, man. Yeah, they, they want to capitalize on the name recognition. That's all it is. And it was the same with uh, Rings of Power. They, they clearly despised J.R.R. Tolkien. They despised everything he represented and everything he believed in. And what they wanted was the, the IP. They wanted the Lord of the Rings names. So that's because that that's the only it. way that people will listen to their story. Exactly, yeah. Because they don't have stories that anyone is interested in hearing, but if they can just bastardize someone else's work and hijack it and use it as a platform for their message, uh, great, they're happy to do it. But they still and, hate the fact that yeah. that's what they have to resort to. And there's active maliciousness and also glee in what they're doing. They are purposefully malicious in I'll destroying some lore, of these old... Ain't that what Tycho Ta Ta said? Yeah. What did he say? Lore. Yeah, exactly. Like, they come in oh, there... Oh, I'll ruin your wanting... mythos in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what he yeah. said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they come into these properties wanting to tear down the problematic elements and, and literally, like, Rings of Power, Wheel of Time TV adap adaptation was so clear. That's what they did. I think even the showrunner said, I'm absolutely going to be injecting my feminist narrative into the, sh into the show, right? Because there are elements of the classic Wheel of Time book series that modern day would consider really problematic. Like, the magic has a gendered nature where there is a different magic for women and a different magic for men, which imposes a gender binary in the very lore of the series. So, of course, that's too problematic. And so they came in and they basically never even acknowledged that that was the case to the point where now it's retconned. That doesn't exist in the TV show adaptation. Um, and then they come in with maliciousness to crap on the fans. Velma is a, a perfect example where they don't like the fans, they don't like the properties, so they come in with active maliciousness to uh, destroy because it's problematic. Remember, they have a narrative that they want to push forward, and so therefore, you know, classic masculinity, the heroes, they need me to torn down. Luke Skywalker, Indiana Jones, right? Those are toxic men tear them down and then they have glee in what they're doing because they are now pushing that what they want to put on the pedestal their new heroes the new ray the new I, uh, phoebe right. waller bridge character in in indiana jones and uh, it's active it's intentional it's blatant they've admitted it multiple times and so all of this is absolutely true with what ripper is saying they hate the fans they hate the properties and they're doing it for an agenda 
and they're blatant about it. And so therefore let it all burn. They don't deserve it. <laughs> well, and, uh, I, I, I think the the really distressing but, thing that you're talking about is to burn something down is easy to quote Star Trek two. <laughs> You know, <laughs> the, uh, uh, it's always been easier the, to destroy than to, to, create. to create. Now, here's here's my problem with our entire modern age. There's a lot of people that want to make change, but they're not offering something new to replace what has existed. Well, they're, they, not, they they're not offer offering something new, but it's crap. It's them. It's their you know, well, but, but, but it, but progressive it, but it, kind of thing. But it really isn't new. They're not. They're not. They're 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 offering a new ideology, but they're not offering to build systems that are going to uh, uh, benefit everybody. Like ideology isn't going to pay for my health care. You know, and and if you're and, and not only that, it's subverting my health care because you're trying to uh, uh, make medical technology uh, no longer based on science and biology, but based on ideology. I mean, my mother, my mother had two radical mastectomies over the course of three years. She had breast cancer. And uh, breast cancer only really, I mean, yes, men can get breast cancer, but the majority of people that get breast cancer are women. It is a biological condition that women suffer from. It killed my grandmother. It almost killed my mother. Um, when you start talking about like making it like, well, you know, not look, our money needs to be spent understanding why breast cancer exists. And when we live in a world where people are trying to change definitions of things, well, that's great. No one's trying to change definitions of any biology other than human beings. The rest of the natural world, you know, is not really subject <laughs> to changing ideology. It's only human beings are. And, and I'm a believer that there's a lot of marginalized people that don't have a voice. I'm all for it. As a matter of fact, tell me your story. I want to hear it. Make it good, but tell me your story. But when we start talking about your truth and my truth, I'm like, what is the truth? And and the real thing is that ideology, I mean, storytelling is, uh, if you look at it, and it goes back thousands of years. We're dealing with uh, stories, not just the Greek gods. We're dealing with Gilgamesh. We're dealing with the Norse gods. We're dealing with all kinds of different storytelling that has been evolved over thousands of years. And all of a sudden, people want to walk in in the last 20 or 30 and decide, well, these stories didn't work. <laughs> really? They didn't work? It's been thousands of years. And I was going to bring it back to Tolkien. Professor Tolkien was telling a story, a specific story about what he perceived happening to England as a result of what, what he experienced during World War I, the idea of mechanization destroying the uh, agrarian or the... The, the, the British countryside, if you try and make a show where you are not considering what Professor Tolkien himself was putting into his work, which is how he perceived the world he lived in, you are betraying the story he's telling. And I think what I can't stand is all the people that are taking over these, whether it's Roddenberry's Star Trek, which has been completely bastardized since 2017. Actually, I'd say since 2009, but I'm going to say since 2017 when it, the, 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 the message has been, uh, I mean, you have, you have a future where human beings are marrying and procreating with aliens in the 23rd century. But in modern Star Trek, in the 31st century, you have a non-binary person lecturing a gay man about pronouns. This is problematic. This is a future that lacks imagination and a future that has a, a lack of understanding. When, when human beings are making love and having children with aliens, I don't think gender binaries or whatever on this planet really matters very much. But they make it a point to deal with it in modern Star Trek in a ham-fisted, terrible way that undermines all of the storytelling. And it goes back to is, what that that comic book writer was, or sorry, that comic book store uh, guy was saying. Like these writers, they can only project themselves and their own ideas or oh, their own uh, values into stories. They can't and, project and anything else. They haven't seen the stories that have already done that better than yeah, they're. They doing think it. they're brave. They think they're brave and bold with everything that could create. And it's like it's this already, already been, been told. Done. We've already told yeah. this story. 
in beautiful ways. I mean, my God, Enterprise, which is not considered to be one of the great uh, Star Trek stories of all time or Star Trek shows of all time. The last, well, the last, there's three episodes, but the last two episodes, T Terra Prime and Demons, deal with a hybrid child, a human Vulcan hybrid kid, and xenophobia and racism in a beautiful way. It was already done. And modern, <laughs> here's the kicker. The people that are, watch, or are making modern Star Trek haven't watched Star Trek. They're not encyclopedic in terms of their knowledge of what the very franchise they're working in has already done and done way better than they have. And it yeah. drives me insane. They need like a Pablo Hidalgo for Star Trek. That was Elon Musk a joke. Buy, they need him to buy the franchise and just fucking fire everyone and then say, yeah, we're, we're resetting. We're going to start again because that's the only way you're going to fix a, a franchise like that. The... Um, this super chat that I saw actually kind of fits neatly into what I was going to talk about next. Um, given that a number of Disney actors are now coming out as violent people in their personal lives, do you think a soft reboot or a further, or to a further extent, a scorched earth policy with the whole universe forcing a decade long hiatus on their IPs is what's needed? Um, I don't think a decade long hiatus is needed necessarily, but I pause in the companies though. Yeah, like, you can't just scrap stuff just for the sake of scrapping it. That's not that's not good enough. Like because if the same people are going to rebuild the mm -hmm. next the next thing, you're going to get the same problem. Exactly. I like, think uh, a yeah, a, a changing of the guard would definitely be needed. Um, and yeah, you're going to have to have a scorched earth. Yeah, yeah, it, that is kind of scorched earth because there there's so many of them now within companies like Disney that you're going to have to have wholesale bloodletting of the company in order to purge it of this. Stuff. I mean, and that I'm is going to about disrupt. a complete purge. And if you were worth it, then we'll have to rehire you. But everybody's gone. Like everybody top to bottom is out of there. That's that's just what it's not going to happen. But I think that's that's how the infestation is. It's more of like you would have to like if I walked into D.C. right now or something like that, I'm like, hey, I'm sending out a memo via email and I'm telling them in an email. Your email won't even work 30 minutes uh, after after we send this off because everybody's out everybody's gone and we'll then we'll start working on bringing other people back in uh to get this thing fixed that will never happen but that mm. what, that's what's going to need to happen it's happened once with twitter and it was amazing well, yeah, true. very true yeah, very true. yeah. Mm. it was amazing how hard it was for elon to dig out the infection like it was buried in the code he was finding hidden code that was blacklisting people and doing shadow banned things that he almost had to rebuild the code from the ground up and he what he even finds hidden like like shirts in, in the storage thing of like yeah. work propaganda and then there were employees that were still fully on board with the work propaganda and stuff that were hiding under the radar still trying to push and still trying to get things done and so it was amazing how difficult it was for him to dig out that infestation but that's the type of thing that needs to happen you're absolutely right ripper um but with how hard it was for just Elon on a much smaller company, oh, man, like, you know, Disney, and really that, that's impossible. and the only way he could do that was to literally buy yeah, the he entire had to, company. Yeah. Yep, true, good point. <laughs> And so, like, I got a CEO of Disney doesn't own the company; they're just there to manage it. And so, he doesn't have that kind of authority. You would, you'd have to have someone like Elon Musk come in and buy Disney to make mm -hmm. that kind of change, and that's that's not even feasible. But it does tie into that point that I was going to talk about next um, with violent people working at Disney. Obviously, Jonathan Majors been at court, uh, been under investigation for claims of assault, and he's been found guilty. Um, found guilty of assault and uh, harassment now. And he has now been dropped by Marvel. And I guess I wonder what the fallout is going to be and how it's possibly going to be managed, right? Because like him or not, like whether you think the character was botched um, in terms of his introduction, he definitely was. But Kang was a massive part of the MCU in terms of their overarching story. And I wonder what the hell do you do with him now you can't just like blink him out of existence without any explanation there would have to be something and it's recasting him is going to be difficult because you've kind of established that every version of him everywhere is jonathan majors so i don't know what they do going forward I mean, but it seems like they, lose lose 
they could just ignore him and, and pretend Kang doesn't exist, and I, I don't think saying. it would impact the quality at all with what they're making. Like, no, one, no one cares. Intro from Drink of Theirs, if like, yeah, Disney would never break continuity, destroy everything. That's not something they would ever uh, engage in. Too. If they literally never mention Kang again, I, I, I don't think people would even fucking care, especially if they waved Doctor Doom, Magneto, Mephisto, or Galactus in their face. Like, look at I this. mean, would there, surely there would be fans who would say, "Hey, this 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 Kang guy, he was supposed to be a big deal." These are the same Where's fans. He gone? Who don't know what happened in Secret Invasion, despite posting about how much it was amazing. They already don't know. They've already forgotten Ahsoka. These are the people who just <laughs> just be like. Besides, if uh, if he's been found guilty, they'll be like, "I'm glad. I'm glad they didn't reference him. I'm glad they're ignoring it." That sort of thing. Like, it, yeah. I, I mean, I, the I, end of Loki season two where he becomes the god of stories, which they sort of leaned into in uh, the comics as well. You know, if we never saw Kang again, you could point to Loki season two and yeah, say, you can, well, there you go. Be fair, Loki could have made anything happen at that point, yeah, so you can yeah. say you erased Kang. I mean, the, I think the funny thing about Kang is they always tried to bring him down to Earth. He was always too human of a villain. I mean, I think Jonathan Majors is actually a, a tremendous talent as an actor. And physically, he's a he's a great presence. Uh, he has another film he made that I desperately want to see. I don't know if you've seen it, Chris. Magazine Dreams. Yeah, one of our writers oh. uh, said it's really good. But yeah, he's a body builder in that. Was, yeah, and it it's supposed, supposed to be a great film. It was supposed yeah, to come out in December, and they were going to push him for Oscars. It's I'm owned by Searchlight. It's owned by Disney. It's going to get buried. Yep. And I, you know, I think I think that look, Jonathan Majors doesn't have the greatest reputation in the industry. But I think he's delivered. I mean, Creed Three. He was, uh, I think, a tremendous antagonist. He has a really great screen presence when he's allowed to act. And I think it's unfortunate that I would love to have seen him uh, play a Thanos type role. But they didn't. They didn't build him up that way. He just kept getting defeated. You know, in Loki season one in Quantum Mania, he 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 was a he was a guy. Whereas Thanos was a larger than life personality that they spent a long time sort of uh, teasing him. But when he finally came into his own, he was a great antagonist where they kept defanging uh, Kang with yeah. what they'd already done. Yeah, you can only show your you can show your bad guy losing so many times before he just loses his uh, his intimidation factor. And that's exactly what they did with him. And we've talked about this before. I know these are all different variations of him, but then you associate that with the character. And if you just see him do nothing but lose, it just builds up that picture in your mind that this guy's not a threat. Because yeah, it's weird the way they him. did that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. him being defeated by ants was just pathetic. <laughs> Communist ants, no less. Yeah. I mean, th th <laughs> this was a man, you know, Ramatep and all that new apocalypse back in ancient Egypt. And he was at the end of time. I mean, and yet they still managed. I, I think they, they didn't give him the mystique he deserved. He was he was always doing things that were so, well, down to earth, which yeah. sort of was a bummer. Well, yeah, when he says, like, I am Kang, you talk to ants. It's like, eh. you want to hear dialogue a little more, um, <laughs> I don't know, aged and powerful from a character like that instead of like, man, you suck. It's almost on par with Napoleon when the, the Ridley Scott movie where he's just like going to the British ambassador. You think you're so great because you have boats. <laughs> that was an actual line. Really? <laughs> oh my god. Fucking yeah. Napoleon. Yeah, really. I'm sure he said that. <laughs> Jesus. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know just... what I it does, I don't know what they'll do. I I just don't care, is what at the same time. Um <laughs> What what I found interesting, it came out in the and I I didn't pay too much attention to the trial stuff. I only watched a couple of videos, but one of the things that came out was a line he said to his girlfriend, uh, Majors, and it was something along the lines of like how important he felt he was, like he's some type of idol to people. He was a there. great man. Yeah, he was on uh, par with like Malcolm X and I mean the narcissism of you know Hollywood actors. 
you, you, you sometimes wonder if it's just an isolated case with this random nutcase like Amber Turd or something like that. But it's so consistent. As soon as something comes out about these people, what they actually say in private and what they think of themselves, it's just like these people are awful. They're so up themselves. I couldn't give a crap about them now. I agree. No, th those texts were like, you know, obviously the things he's been um, convicted of are, are terrible, but like the the thing that's equally damning is just the insight into his personality and mm -hmm. oh man it's just it's and, dire yeah i know and that's why it's so refreshing when you actually come across a celebrity that does seem to be level-headed and a real like henry cavill that actually uh, is grateful for what they have they don't think they're you know the best things in sliced bread and stuff like that and their people respond very positively because we, we just want you know decent people um, uh, in these roles and things. Yeah, like you say, people who are just grateful to be doing this stuff. Yeah, because and they should you know, be grateful. They're they're so damn privileged to be in positions that they have to get the fame that they have. Um, uh, also, of course, the fact that they get all this money. And then when you see like Rachel Zegler say, "I deserve to be paid X amount for every hour I'm in a Disney dress," it's like, oh really? Do you think that for the you know actors that work in the parks that are in those dresses all day? But no, the entitlement that comes out of Hollywood is just sickening. The other thing I was um, curious to know about, because I know, Chris, you've seen it. You have seen uh, Rebel Moon. Oh, yeah. Zach Snyder's <laughs> magnum opus. <laughs> Dropping, what, what tonight at, at 7 or something? Yeah. 7? Yeah, so it's like 3 a.m. for us at, here in the UK, because we're... What? We should be the prime time zone. <laughs> I, I got to say, I'm excited. I never thought anyone would make a Battle Beyond the Stars remake. That's what yeah. I said. It's a Battle Beyond... It's, it's a remake of Battle Beyond the Stars... Which was, uh, which is a fucking amazing movie. I love Battle Beyond. Love the it. Stars. The best Star Wars ripoff, Seven Samurai ripoff ever. Seven, yeah, Seven yeah. Samurai, Magnificent Seven. It's Battle Beyond the Stars, but far less interesting. Um, with it, it's just it's a mess. I mean, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. I get what James Wan was going for. This thing is utter. It's Zack Snyder unleashed, but he's he's it's it's nothing works. Everything is done in it, it the way it looks like he colored the movie. It's incredibly muddy. It looks like Zack Snyder was singing. No, Instagram not from a movie. Zack Snyder film. Surely right, not. Right. Well, <laughs> that's par for the course. But no, it's terrible. Not just from the script, but also the world building. You know, it starts out with uh, what's her name? Um, the the main character's name, what's her name? Cora or something like that. She's plowing a field. She's a farmer. And it's just like, it's just like battle beyond the stars. A big ship comes and says, we're coming back and we're going to take all your, all your produce that you produce over the coming season. And then she goes off because she used to work for this galactic empire and is collecting different types of people, different mercenaries who have something against the empire, including an old general and a woman who has the samurai swords played by Boondai, uh, who fights, um, a spider played by Jenna Malone in a weird scene. That's one of the better scenes that works, but it's a complete and utter mess. And this is, this is, uh, by the way, if you go to a Walmart in uh, the United States here, you will find that they already have rebel moon action figures out. Hmm. They exist. There's a coming prequel comic with stories about these characters they all they needed was one good movie, and they don't have that by all accounts. Did y'all um, talk? Do you know who wrote that? Who's writing the prequel comic? Yes, I do. I've heard that. Mags yeah. Masaggio. That's yeah. um for people that know about the comic book industry, you uh, know of that person. We'll call them that person. Uh, what 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 a way to get everybody thrilled about your <laughs> your new property. You get Mags to write your prequel comic. One of the and Mags says that. Uh, they were hand selected by Zack Snyder, um, which can is, you get canceled for hand selecting now? What, <laughs> <laughs> generally speaking, but I guess not in this case. Um, so if that is true, if that is to be the case, um, yeah, what what a move. Let's just say that I don't understand it. Um, but I'm not going to try to pretend like I understand everything that's going on with Hollywood. Just when I heard that, I mean. I'm not going to pretend like I was just stoked for freaking Rebel Moon. Uh, I wasn't, but 
I just can't imagine what that like um, from all the writers. Like it's a prequel comic. It's a brand new property. And you have all these writers, legends all around. And you say, you know what? I think Max, Max, that's who we're going with to, to pop this bad boy off. It's, I don't get it. Chris, I'm just going to. Oh, oh, sure. so, oh, sorry, I was just going to say to Robert's point, I think Hollywood not only does a lot of hand selecting these days, but with Ezra Miller, I believe it was a mouth selection. But anyway, <laughs> I Chris, I would I would ask you, you know, it's come out. Uh, Zack Snyder has talked about the fact that that he's made two different versions of this movie. And right. the version we haven't seen is this R rated, uh, uh, much, much different interpretation of the film that um, he says you know, is, is I, I don't know if it's his preferred version, the way Peter Jackson would say that the extended versions of Lord of the Rings are, but I find it interesting. They're, they're trying to appeal to the Snyder Cut fans. Like, it's streaming. It's not theatrical. Why wouldn't Zack Snyder make uh, his definitive version of the film? And he's made multiple versions of his past films. Watchmen has three different versions, for instance. Um, Dawn of the Dead has a... a two different versions why do you think he just didn't deliver his definitive version of the film in the first place uh because he, vision he's, of army of the dead that's in focus right right i i i just think that he's incredibly indecisive as a creator jj abrams has the same problem but jj abrams is ballless and just um when you look at the star wars sequels it's like they didn't have the guts to actually um execute on some of the better ideas not to say that um i mean there were better ideas floating around that latest interview with Adam driver, where he kind of reveals basically they didn't know what the F they were doing. It's like, yeah, oh, we, we knew that, but um, rebel moon is like, I'll, I'll just say this um, because you're all going to be able to see it in a few hours. Actually. Um, there's not a single Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited. There's not a single idea or moment in the film that is original. It it's oh it owes most of I mean you mentioned Battle Beyond the Stars which I have a fondness for that movie love it um because I, I saw it when I was a kid Sybil Danning yeah Sybil Danning I have a Sybil her... Danning Battle Beyond the Stars action figure right over here oh my nice. god the, the globulous <laughs> breasts anyways um I mean like big globes so uh and the score for the score for Battle Beyond the Stars which is basically James Horner ripped himself off for Star Trek II the Wrath of Khan. Another conversation. Yeah. And but, he also uh, ripped Goldsmith off from his Star Trek, the motion picture score. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. There's, uh, but I love it. Yeah. Yeah. But this is, there's not a moment in it that you haven't seen in another movie. I mean, it's literally, it, it's sort of taking a little bit of battle beyond the stars and then ice pirates. I'm not even joking. No, on ice on. pirates. Come on. Not dude. joking on ice pirates. Um, uh, Krull, only because I know these movies well, because I grew Krull. up watching the movies like that because, you know, it would be like, okay, we live in a, a, an abundance of stuff that we can watch, everything from anime to series and all this, and to the point where it's like, I've got stuff on backlog, right? But when Rob and I, not to go like, you know, I used to walk We're 10 miles to school. Ancient. Yeah. Um, it would be like a year and it'd be like, Hey, there are four science fiction movies that are going to come out this year and that's it. Or maybe two. And then a year like 1982 comes along and that kind of blows things up mm. the story. But, but it's all this old eighties sci-fi that, that influenced it. And the concept of, Hey, I want to do like an R rated star Wars. That would have been cool. Or star Wars for adults would like to have seen that. What, what I saw, which you actually can go see it in a theater, Rob, in 70 millimeter at the Egyptian, it's playing at a couple. If you look it up, it is playing in theaters um, in, a, in a sparse way. But uh, it, it what they ended up with was just this compromised, generic science fiction movie that feels like it was cobbled together from AI. There's even a couple shots in it that are very anime inspired that kind of feel like Akira. And it's like, oh, that's a cool shot from Akira. I'm just going to use that and I'm going to use this and I'm going to use this literally like the claw into some 80s sci-fi toy machine, grabbing mm. moments and lines and whatever to the point where it feels like it was written by AI. So it's God awful. I, I think it's a huge <laughs> mess. I don't care what happens in part two. There is at the end in the third act, there are a few moments where you're like, Oh, okay. I kind of see where this is going. I don't care. And there's even a, another scene that's a complete ripoff 
of the cantina scene from the original Star Wars, but done lesser. So everything that he does that he rips off is just a worse version of the source material. It's a comp for me, it's a complete fail. You might find some things to like about it, but I really didn't like it down to the score down to the like, okay, I get it. You're going to do fast and then you're going to go slow motion. So you can extend these sh shots. You know, that's like a Snyder trope where he's constantly yeah. the, the like, and it's slow motion and no, it just doesn't like, dude, um, it definitely lacks, uh, there's a vision. It just doesn't work and it lacks cohesion. So, I mean, yeah. given that Zack so Snyder depressed. hasn't made a good movie in 14 years now. <laughs> um, yeah. How yeah. does he keep still getting gigs? Like, why do people hire him? I was going to ask, actually, gonna um, get Zach. for Chris and Robert, what did you think of Army of the Dead, assuming you guys saw it? It was my first movie back from the pandemic. And I have to say that Dawn of the Dead, Romero's Dawn of the Dead, is one of my favorite films of all time. And I... I, I I didn't know who Zack Snyder was, but the fact that he remade Dawn of the no, Dead. No, 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 no. Army of the Dead. No, no, no. Army wait, wait. I, I'm just giving you oh, a preamble. Okay. <laughs> I'm giving you a preamble. Okay. So, <laughs> so I I was primed to hate Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. I watched it. I liked it. I was surprised. So Army of the Dead was my first movie back. I went to the Chinese theater after the pandemic. I'm like, my God. And it was my birthday movie. Elizabeth and I drove into Hollywood to see Army of the Dead. I was all primed. I'm like, he can't F this up, right? Well, I know I, where this is going. Then. I, <laughs> I uh, hated Army yeah. of the Dead. And I hate, I, dude, I even have Hot Toys figures from Sucker Punch. And I don't even like that movie. But I, <laughs> I, 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 I was so, this is my, pandemic return to a movie theater and i was so disappointed so Fair disappointed up. he was the filmmaker i most wanted to despise back when he made the remake of dawn of the dead and i liked it love the opening credit sequence sarah Polly's in that the opening uh yeah. sequence when like that movie i thought army of the dead was just a gigantic tapestry of incompetence and i I, I, when it was over, I was, I probably was weeping for cinema, <laughs> all cinema everywhere. It's funny you say that. I, that, that one along I'm with a couple of others, I consider anti films. They're like in a trophy case of just, they, they shouldn't exist. <laughs> the, Dude, the antithetical. They, they, they are, they're, they're the, like, especially Army of the Dead is the epitome of having an open goal and still missing. Like, yeah. you've got like a, a bank Vegas. movie with a time, a ticking clock. Fight your way through an army of zombies in Vegas to get to a vault, crack it open, get the money, get out. Like it's a fun little setup. I think you could have you a need lot the most of fun basic with that. Character writing in history to get a, a film to pass on that one. Like yeah. literally as simple as cowardly guy who always complains, big buff guy who maybe you know just stuff like yeah, that. Suave, like, even sophisticated that. guy. Yeah, like <laughs> I, you know, there were so many things in that film that were uh, that made no sense at all yeah, and yeah and i i felt i was watching i was watching a, the cinematic version of a screenplay that a bunch of stone dudes who started smoking pot at like 2 a.m they decided to stamp and like you know what whatever we write by 6 a.m we're gonna go film that <laughs> and they did i would legit i'd love to talk to zach snyder and just ask him about some of the creative choices he's why. made. <laughs> yeah, just, just like Zach. So your entire career, why? <laughs> but you know what? The thing is, you gotta like him. And he's so affable. And I, I, I actually, as a human being, I've never met him. But I, you know, he's always dressed so snappily, and he's in great shape, and he's got a cute wife, and all of his choices in life seem to be good ones. You know, I like him as a person. Whenever I've seen him, and I I watch that movie and I'm like, everything about this movie is wrong, everything, and and how why, or as my friend Chris Carr would say, for why. <laughs> so do do you think his main failing is writing that he can still construct a scene that looks nice and he, he produce can, a 
Mm. Yeah, like even if you look at so, like a generally regarded shit movie like Batman versus Superman, there's some fantastically fun fight sequences in there. Oh yeah. And it's like, okay, he can do action scenes, or at least he can hire the right, you know, stunt teams and fight choreographers to make it look good. So he can do stuff like that. He just can't write a movie. Yeah. And he should not that... be put in charge of writing a film. <laughs> That seems to be one of the issues that I can't, I'm starting to, you know, see more often. It's when directors get some success, then they're given all the control, and then they think, well, now I can write it as well. And when it comes to writing, they have massive flaws and failings. And it's like, oh, maybe you should focus on what you can do well. Focus on finishing the, the film, constructing the scenes, making it all look nice, and get people who know what to do in regards to writing the script. Let them handle that. And I, I don't know if, like, you know, Chris and Rob, you can probably correct me on this one. Is this more of a modern phenomenon, this idea of the, the writer-director who can just do everything? Like, I know they've existed in Hollywood forever, but, like, it feels like everyone thinks they can do it now. And they oh, can. Look, I think Chris can speak to this, too. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone thinks they can make a movie. Like you can walk up to anybody. I I remember when I first moved to LA, God, thirty five years ago, there was a I don't remember a local news story, and they walked up to people on the street, and they would say, "Hey, how is your screenplay going?" <laughs> and I, I I know it was cut together, uh, and I always saw was the people that answered in the affirmative, but they're like, "Oh, it's going great. I'm almost done. I've I've gone through four drafts or whatever." Every person in the world. Because you watch movies, and watching movies should be the only criteria that anybody has before they make one. Because, you know, if you've watched films, of course you know how to make them. But, um, yeah, and, and on this, I'll never forget this. It was There were two things I remember from the summer of 1988 when I moved to L.A. One was the Lakers. Or the L.A. was a wash. The Lakers were going to win the, that championship. And everybody in LA was writing a screenplay because of this news story. So yeah, I mean, I think the problem is people forget that storytelling is first and foremost based in literature. You have to be a person of letters like the drinker is before you can really understand how stories are told. Because even oral tradition requires you have to speak and understand how to tell a story using language. And I think one of the things that's happened, uh, they used to say that, oh, MTV filmmaking. We had MTV filmmaking 40 years ago when Tony Scott made The Hunger. And when The Hunger first came out, people were like, what is this movie? It's incomprehensible. Now you watch The Hunger and everybody gets, oh, we're in ancient Egypt now. and We're jumping back and forth in time. Flashdance was a, a movie, an MTV film. But people still, Adrian Lyne read books. <laughs> Nowadays, we have creators wanting to make films that don't have any understanding of literature. They, they haven't read the classics. And, and when I say the classics, I mean, I'm not even religious. But you know, if you read the Old and New Testament or even the Koran or whatever, uh, the Bhagavad Gita that Oppenheimer's quoted as saying, there, uh, there's great, there's great storytelling to be found there, and that's where all of our cinematic legacy comes from: words, literature, and nobody reads anymore, and we see it on our screens. It's amazing. Yeah. We are seeing on our movie screens the lack of letters in people's backgrounds, and it's not just reading; it's also actually studying the craft of writing. There are technical objective standards when it comes to writing to understand character, plot progression, pacing. And if you actually want to get into the literature side of thing, yeah, then it's sentence construction when to use setisms versus beats. And so much technicality goes into writing something well that it seems like a lot of these director writers, they just think, well, I've made a film. I've seen story. I can, I can do it. And it feels like Zack Snyder is kind of falling into that trap a bit where he's trying to write too much instead of, you know, focusing on his strengths. 
Well, I think all of our great filmmakers, I mean, the the auteurs, for instance. I mean, you look at Tarantino. He loves words. He loves words. And and great dialogue is, is written by people that love the sound of what people say. You know, one of my favorite movies of all time is All About Eve. Best picture, 1950. Joseph Makowitz. It's the movie where... Betty Davis says, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. I mean, the words, words is what how we communicate with each other. I mean, when you see the theatrical tradition translated to cinema, when we can hear, we love our, our favorite characters. It's all about what they say, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, 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 and that's all literature. And that's you what know, makes movies I'm sorry. No. Yeah, like it, it's such a pity that we see such a lack of good complex writing these days. That when I go back and watch something that has really good writing, especially dialogue, like it just hits. So I'm just started rewatching Community again. Some of the dialogue uh, written in that show is just uh, absolutely phenomenal, especially because uh, one of the main characters, right, is supposed to be really manipulative with his words. And so to be able to write that character, you need to be smart enough to be able to be manipulative with your words to ca- come across. And there's just like this one line just in the episode I watched the other day where they're trying to um, get this character to convince um, uh, Chang, who is the teacher of the thing, to to you know, give him some slack and is like, how could I convince him to do that? If I can't even convince you, if I can't even convince you to not make me do it or something like that. And it was just such a really subtle manipulative line that that, that first they buy into, then they realize what he was doing. They're like, you are convincing. It's just like clever stuff like that is filled like all throughout that show. Just when you come across really good writing, Oh, it's satisfying. And it's lacking so much in the modern. I, I want to pose a question to our host. The drinker is a man that fills a blank page with words. <laughs> and Not I, necessarily I, good words. No, but I, but I, but I, but I say this in, in all uh, uh, respect. I mean, one of my, one of my dreams in life is to be able to write a book. I don't know if I have the wherewithal to do so. But when you, sir, sit down, I mean, you're a published author. What's it like when you are facing a blank page? How do you begin? What do you do? How do you tell your stories? I mean, usually for me, it's been cooking away in my head for days or weeks already. So I know at least where I want to go with it. And so getting started is relatively easy. Um, The hard part is the middle part. Like when you're just starting a story, it's this great adventure. Like it could be the greatest book ever written for all you know, because nothing's been put down on the page yet. It's all up to you to make it work. And when you're getting close to the end, again, it's hugely exciting because the end is in sight. You're on the home stretch. You're almost there. Uh, the hard part is those four or five months that are in the middle where you're just grinding away, getting it done. And that's the the difficult part. And I think that's where so many writers just stop because it's day after day writing and making the time for it and not necessarily doing some big spectacular scene that's going to change the whole course of the book. It's just the the building blocks of getting things moving forward in the story and that can kill people as writers that can just like stop their momentum dead uh, because it just becomes too hard after a while. So how do you write uh, the voice of a character? Do you, do you actually perform a, a character out loud? I mean, how do you do it? It does help. It does help to say it out loud because one, it helps you understand like, is this something a human being would actually say it or does it sound really weird? And it sounds like a robot saying it. And two, yeah, you get a sense of how the character would say things. You you get to know their personality. And I've said this before, like with a good, well-written character, I can picture what they would do in almost any situation, like mm. way outside the bounds of the story, just like if I plonk them into this situation with these people, how would they react to it? And if I know their personality, I know they're a well-written character and I've got a good sense of who they are. Yeah, so, and, and to develop that, I feel you need to understand human nature a bit character people like because you get to a point where you get familiar with someone's personality 
to such a point that you can kind of preempt what they might say given certain things. And that's kind of like the way I develop my own characters in my writing as well, is that you get so familiar with the character to the point where you can preempt how they would behave, how they would act in a given scene, in a given character, to a response to a character, to dialogue and stuff. And then when you get to that point, the story almost starts to write themselves because you just put these characters that you're so familiar with within the scene and let them react the way that they naturally would. This is where you run into problems because like nine times out of ten, if I get writer's block or at least I struggle to know how to end a scene, it's because I'm trying to make the characters do things that are out of character for them. Well, now I have to to service the plot. I have to ask Eric because uh, Eric is somebody who's combining writing with visuals. Mm-hmm. Which is, I mean, the closest thing to cinema. I mean, uh, without yeah, making all a that film, stuff is storyboarded anyway. It's the same thing. Uh, yeah, it's it, you're yeah. you're using shot progression, so you're using images to add meaning to your words. How do you, sir, begin a story? Like, like how is it when you when you conceive of a character and you want to tell your story? Uh, how does it begin for you? It's similar to what like what, what Chad said for me. Like me everybody's different and that's the cool thing about you know writing is that everybody kind of has their approach that works for them but for me i have to understand the characters in order to put them in a situation that uh that makes sense so i have a universe bible that's where i start with everything Um, that's interesting okay so i will i have an entry and i have these sort of can i can i stop you and ask you how long did it take you to come up with that bible uh I was uh, about a year in before before I had even put like the story together. I had developed Isom. I had developed uh, Yaira as well, all these characters. And with my entry, I have like a template, all these things that I, I, I absolutely have to have. And it's challenging, right? Because it's like, who is this character? Um, you know, what, what motivates them? What, what is their actual, uh, uh, approach in any given situation or, you know, what's the defining traits, what, all, what, everything, uh, even like, I will go to the extent of creating the characters, family members. If I, if I feel they're going to be, uh, that that's going to be like a mainstay kind of character. So even if I don't reveal everything in that first story, so whether it be for, um, like I saw one, Um, As an example, our first book, there's so much that we've already fleshed out with that character within my universe Bible that the audience doesn't know about. But the reason why I approach it that way is because from the actual like story and the experience it is that I'm given, it doesn't matter who it is. I some whoever the character may be, Mm. I need to understand them in order to put them in a believable situation, because if I don't understand them, how can the how can the audience uh uh, understand them as well and the stories again to shad's kind of point with that approach at least in my experience and how i write the the stories almost start to write themselves because i know who that character is right um before i ever get started and actually s- start writing the story that, that's my approach is just what's what's uh what's worse uh what, what has worked for me i guess so you guys all three of you would you say that there has to be a lot of work done before you even start? You have to understand the world, the situations, everything that informs a character before you even put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard. <laughs> I, I think Eric. for me, it's um, I don't know how how Shad and Eric do it, but like when I have got the initial idea for what I want my story to be. I'll take some time to write a synopsis for it because I want to know where it's going. Mm. Like, I don't mm. want to just get into this story and then change my mind halfway through because I've had a better idea or whatever. I want to, like, get the best stuff out there and make sure it forms a cohesive story. And then I start writing the actual book. Um, and that usually keeps me on track. And it lets me know, like, okay, does it make sense? Do the characters do things that uh, are consistent for them? Does everyone have a nice arc? in the course of the story and does it all end up in a fairly satisfying dramatic conclusion um that's my goal with it and so i usually know where i start and where i'm going to end when i just start actually writing the book that's my goal yeah a lot of writers have different approaches and one of the kind of or two of the more uh I guess, classic styles that have kind of arisen from people sharing their experience on the matter is that there are writers that pre-plan a lot of things 
kind of dot point the the plot and they they refer to usually as architects um or uh, an architect style of writing and there are writers that discover the story as it goes and don't plan anything ahead and yeah. both have re- resulted in really great stories patrick rothfuss is famous for it being uh, a type it's kind of they call it kind of gardening or discovery writing where he doesn't plan anything ahead he has a vague understanding of maybe a type of arc that a character might go on but he loves to uh, discover the story as he writes and then the other extreme awesome scott card he uh, has shared and is famous for being a really strict kind of architect where he pre- he plans everything in a story to dot point kind of precision to the point where when he's finally ready to write he just gets that written in like a week to a month because he understands so clearly of everything that happens and all these approaches are valid well and you want to find the one that actually produces good results but these approaches have produced great results also Kakad, phenomenal writer patrick Rothfuss, phenomenal writer uh, and so it's a matter of practice for the individual writer to find which way they do it to yeah. get good stuff by the way shout out to tony brooks i just want to say uh this morning the answer to your query or wondering is this morning. Just saying. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what that's referenced to, but sure. <laughs> it's okay. Well, let's let's do let's do a few super chats before we finish up. How does that sound? Cool. You gentlemen, I'm sure the chat's got some questions for you. So I'll start right here with Stephen Bobo, who says, Hey everybody on this panel, what's everybody's opinion on the completest situation? Plus, quick question to Shad. <laughs> Which sword is better, He-Man's power sword or Lionel's sword of omens? Okay, so in terms of design, just the like how functional it is, Lionel's sword hands down is actually re- like it's not too bad. Lionel's it's because it extends, and, isn't it? And the fact that it can grow bigger and stuff, and uh, I mean, out of the like my own personal nostalgia, He-Man is like one of my all-time favorite. I just love He-Man so much. Of classic E Man, not this what? abomination, revolution, revelation. Bull crap oh, thing. god, yeah. Shad, what about Prince Talon's sword from Sword and the Sorcerer that shoots? Ooh, <laughs> that's a great Chris. sword. I, I think I have a dedicated video breaking down that sword alone <laughs> on Shadowversity. It, uh, that was so that was good. Cool. Yeah, there's so many fictional swords for you to review. It's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, love so it. I love uh, it. Keeps it fun. The other question, yeah, what was this question? The completest situation. I mean, what completionists, and they're talking about how he took money for as much as a decade and kept it all in a bank instead of delivering it to the charity. He got found out by two YouTubers. He has since donated and made a complaint of basically being like, I was slandered and they should uh, be careful. I might just sue them and that people being unfair and all this stuff. And now I think his reputation is completely burned because though he didn't steal any money, um, you don't keep the money for that many years and not tell anybody what you're doing with it. Yeah, it was just resting in a high interest savings account. Eh? <laughs> well, so part of the problem is people have said no, like if you had donated 600k uh when it was given compared to now, it would have been worth a hell of a yeah. lot more back then. So you know there's that there's his attitude toward the whole thing. I happen to line up with a couple of people saying that um you know had he just owned it and said I was fucking ill-suited to run a charity i didn't take any of it for myself i just didn't know what to do i got tangled up i was an idiot and i shouldn't be in charge of a charitable operation i've tried to make it right and the whatever you know happens happens the result but his response is particularly bad then there's the aspect that he claimed um any and all expenses in relation to running the charity were covered with you know additional donations via like twitch bits or memberships and stuff but he's also quoted as saying in these streams that all bits and everything else go to the charity. So now there's a complication of how much he's been spending charity money on running the operation and thus spending charity money on his own expenses. And so that's gotten him in loads of trouble as well. From what I can tell, uh, he's in big trouble and he's been dropped from like one of his regular podcasts. There's a game that he had a cameo in that they removed him from. Like He's not having a good time. That's just... (sighs) Yeah. If I was doing something like that, I would just I would want to give that money to the charity as quickly as possible and not have it sit in any of my accounts and not me be responsible for it because it's exactly situations like that. It's um, the yeah, worst, just... I think, of it in terms of damning his characters. They've released calls they had with him before they went public, and you can tell that his only concern is how, how he will look. He keeps asking questions. And at one point, there's this moment where he says, guys, listen, I'm not saying that I 
that, I, that I'll give you money to don't <sighs> say anything. But, and then like moves on to, and it's just like, you fucking fool. Why would you try and bribe them or even come close to implying it? As, uh, <sighs> you got that. It, it's all out there. Uh, Mutaha and Carl Jobs. Carl Jobs, I think are the two YouTubers that have gone over this. Extensive detail. I, as far as I can tell, his reputation has burned now. Um, I didn't know the completionist very well before all of this, but I think he's considered one of the like internet sort of nice guys who never does anything wrong, super chill and friendly, and runs things happily well. And so this has uh, not been good for a lot of his fans. Yeah, he was, so. he was at G four, and I think he was yes. in that famous video with Frost. He was the one that awkwardly sits there and uh, yeah. <laughs> know what to do. Yeah, all I can say is Merry Christmas from well, jail. Well, it's oh. a wonderful life. <laughs> he says as well, I, sorry, I forgot. He says it is cool with them. Like, my reputation can't handle this, especially after I was friends with John Tron and it turned out he was racist. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. It's so oh, funny because, you, you know, if you guys were faced with the claim that you hadn't donated what you promised to charity for 10 years and your first reaction is like, but how will this affect my reputation? This is like, uh... Yeah, it's like, maybe you weren't doing this for the right reasons in the first place. Uh, nah, yeah. It's not a good look. Not at all. Chuck, Chuxenhausen says, Cheers! All I want for Christmas is a Reacher review. Wow. Mm. Do what I can. I mean, I reviewed season one already. I haven't seen season two yet, but uh, that and Invincible is my Christmas watching list right there, so... But they stopped done. releasing the episodes until the year! What the... Like I was at episode four, ready to watch episode five, and there's nothing. I'm like, what? Well, it makes it easier for me to watch then, doesn't it? <laughs> four episodes to go. Easy. Have you not watched any of Invincible season two yet? No, I've just I've seen season one, really liked it. So looking forward to season two. Just haven't had time so far. It's uh, uh so far not as good as season one, but I it's funny, there's some improvements in some areas. Um it just doesn't have the menace that season one had with the looming kind of uh you know, truth that was uh, waiting to come out, but it's still quite enjoyable. And uh, episode four was pretty good, so uh, I'm I've, I've been enjoying Invincible so far. But now I have to wait until they release the rest of the episodes. No, oh, fair play. Uh, Master of Puppets says, "Hey, hello. Are you looking forward to the masterpiece that is the American Society of Magical?" Uh, let's <laughs> have Eric finish that one. American uh, finish... Society for Magical Negroes. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Have they called it that just so YouTube reviewers can't go at it because they can't say the name without getting demonetized? But hang on, I, I thought that word was okay for no. everyone to say. Wasn't that the nice version of the N-word? I'm so confused. Is that the nice version? I don't know. I don't Dad, know. Give me the rule list. Come on. Yes. Eric, can you let I mean, us know what the rules? I don't uh, shit, shit. Your guess is as good as mine because you can call people colored. All right, well, I'll, well, you can't call them colored, but you can call them people of color. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know the rules either. Y'all guess as good as mine. <laughs> the rules change from day to day, depending on. I'm who's gonna involved. say it. I'm yeah. gonna say the N word. Yeah. American Society for Magical Negroes. That yeah, that's fine. Right? Negro that's should, fine. Be fine. should be fine. Yeah, be you fine. say Negro leagues when you talk about baseball. Nobody's tripping on that, right? So <laughs> right. like, no, yeah. no. That's I swear fine. that was a word they used to trap YouTubers with, with like you know names with the ends and beginnings to match, and they make them say that and get get them like demonetized and banned. But now I'm like, oh, I guess it's okay to say it if you've got a whole fucking movie that I don't know anymore. I yeah. I don't know. Well, you know, it's uh, well if you're a white person and you feel uncomfortable, then I guess the movie's done its job. Uh, they gotta <laughs> they gotta make us feel better. They gotta prevent us from crying, otherwise we'll destroy the world, right? Well, technically, uh, yeah. out of this whole day... panel. <laughs> Out of this whole panel, we know which role Eric must be filling for us at the time. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, make us feel comfortable. Yeah, Actually, go so see American Fiction. Now, Eric, I'm so yeah. glad you're here to, to <laughs> save me from being such a dangerous animal. Have you American seen Fiction does a good job of addressing this. It's a terrific film. I, I recommend yeah. it to everybody. Yeah, it's American really Fiction. good. Jeffrey Wright. He's so fantastic. He's never been bad. Yeah. He, he played Basquiat. Remember when he played Basquiat? Right. I mean, it's so good. He was great as Jim Gordon. But yeah, American fiction is really good. It's he was about... great as Felix Leiter. Right, right. He's, oh, yeah. It's... Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, he's look, look up the movie American right. Fiction. It's only, I don't think it's in wide release yet, though. It's still limited mm. release. I could be wrong. Could be. It's so good. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um Master of Puppets also says, I uh, just finished House of Usher. Um, awesome recommendation drinker. Thank you very much. Yeah, I enjoyed that so show. Good. So much fun. That was so much fun. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, yeah, the, the the working in of so many elements from from Edgar Allan Poe's poems and and short stories and stuff all into one narrative. It's pretty cool. Um, Jeff Romaddox says, "Have you seen a disturbance in the Force yet? I'm waiting for my Blu-ray of it to come in. I got the recommend from Film Threat and some people I knew that were involved with it from the beginning. It's really it's really good. Have you seen it? Yeah, no, it is really it? good." It's it's a documentary about the behind the scenes making of the Star Wars Holiday Special. What a what a disaster it was behind the scenes. How much George Lucas was involved. It was early days of Star Wars. No one understood what Star Wars was. Bruce Valanche, I did I never knew this was a writer on the Holiday Special. Yep. If you know who Bruce Valanche is, he's a very flamboyantly gay writer who writes mainly jokes for the Oscars award shows. He's been a working writer in Hollywood for decades, but it's such a hilarious documentary about the early days of star Wars. And no one knew, no one understood star Wars. And when variety shows dominated a uh, seventies television with like Donnie, I mean, they show you versions of star Wars on these variety shows that are the worst things you've ever <laughs> seen. The Donnie and Marie, the <laughs> Harvey Corman show, like just terrible, terrible interpretations and mark hamill was on all of it they didn't know how to promote it they didn't know what star wars was this was when movie My, marketing was really unsophisticated because I, i've never seen the holiday special all the way through and what? i'm quite, nor I'm should perfectly, you i'm perfectly fine <laughs> yeah, with that yeah, yeah. i just painful. i remember the bits where carrie fisher was very obviously coked off her tits and harrison ford just looked like he wanted to die yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, there was that Matt Mark Hamill had was it, he just looked so weird. Was it all the makeup or something? He just yeah, because he'd well, been in a just, car accident. Yeah, right? yeah oh, okay. no, no, they did spell that. It's he. It was just TV, and that's they just caked on the makeup. They didn't know what they were doing. It's it's a mess. But I mean, I thought I knew everything about Star Wars. This is like they dug up amazing, amazing stuff. It's it's directed by Jeremy Kuhn, who produced Napoleon Dynamite, and he he's been making. He did the Raiders documentary. Yeah, if you've ever seen that one. Um, I'm in that one. It's about okay. the kids who made the soup, the VHS recreation feature length version of Raiders of the Lost Ark nearly burned down their basement because they used gasoline to, to create a fire. It's watch that Raiders doc. It's really good. Nice. So. Um, Piston says drinker just watched uh, South Park's newest episode. And I just want to let you know uh, you're my third favorite influencer, right after Mauler, Gary, and Shad. Is <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> it's like your third best. Uh, appreciate it. Um, Emilio says Andro season two is delayed. Good news or bad news? Um, it's, it's neutral. Like you're, you know, they need more time to make it better than good. If they're getting delayed because of everything going wrong, then it's bad. Yeah. I, I I wonder if it'll get made. With, with the financial state of things and with Marvel looking to basically, in, in effect, Marvel's taking a year off in, in, in the sense they're just putting out Deadpool 3 in July and that's it. They've yeah. got time to retool. Is part of the retooling about budget? Is it setting forth in a Kangless? Is it going to be the Kangless moving forward? Are they going to um, recast? What are they going to do? I feel like everything is on uh, is on hold because this year, when you look at things that should have performed, at least the fact that the Marvels didn't break a hundred million domestic, it, it stands at one hundred ninety nine million. Shout out to the one nine nine. Um, <laughs> like, shout out. Yeah, yeah. Shout out. But like, it stands at one hundred ninety nine million global, and Aquaman two is gonna do worse. Um, I don't That's think. That's amazing. Think, which right, I think I it's, a, yeah. it's a better wow. movie than the Marvels, um, it, you know, still low bar, but, but um, my God, it's just all the studios have to be looking at, do we even want to delve into superhero stuff? I think the only one that maybe has a shot is I mean, Deadpool three. If Deadpool does anything, Deadpool should kill the Marvel cinematic universe. That should be, that should be the subhead of the film. He just murders the entire universe. They do a reboot after Deadpool three. He murders the whole thing. Yeah, they do a reboot before that. they get their Avengers movies. Right, right. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's no Kang Dynasty happening anymore. That's for we sure. We don't even know who's in the Avengers. Yeah, like, is it the Young Avengers? The Young do Avengers. Do they have a base? I mean, it was destroyed in Endgame. They've never addressed that. I mean, the only time you hear about it is when Doctor Strange tells Wanda, "We'll get you back on the lunchbox." What lunchbox is that, Doctor? 
Yeah, there's there's well, no one's addressed the yeah. fucking celestial that's exploded out of the planet that's halfway out. <laughs> or the there's other one talking to the anymore. planet threatening. I mean, they the have judgment. nothing. They have built nothing. There's nothing for anyone to be excited about. And exactly. let alone, like the power of a singular film at this point, uh, we've talked about this before, it's, uh, it's absolutely hampering them to be a part of the MCU. It was the complete opposite when you rewind like five years plus. It was supposed to be the thing that could sell the movie. It's like, but that's in the MCU. It doesn't matter if I don't care about Jimbo, James, whoever the hero is. It's in the MCU. But these days, it's like, yeah, I'll go see Jimbo. J oh, it's in the MCU. Uh. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Right. And I, like, someone, I asked someone on a, another live stream to just make a list of all the sort of hanging threads from previous uh, Marvel movies, like Shang-Chi and Katie standing in front of Bruce Banner and Captain Marvel, where they're having a conversations about his wristbands. It's the like if you listed out everything. And why wasn't gonna... that in the Marvels? Well, well, like exactly like like someone made a list. It's a crazy list of Things that they're and 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 we've seen what they've done with these movies. It's every new film is your new favorite Avenger. Are there even Avengers? No. That's what I was going to like. Who's sense. going to be in the Avengers film? And exactly I, I can it. think of who's available, and I don't give a crap really about any of them. Like Rhodey is not a replacement for Iron Man, right? And then what? 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 Captain Iron Marvel. Heart. Yeah. Ironheart, oh, freak, like if they have Ironheart and like what Shuri, Black Panther, <laughs> yeah, that's right. funny. Oh, a lot of the God. characters were given replacements, like an Ironheart because Iron Man's dead, or Falcon's not going to replace Captain America. So it's funny how they've got replacements coming in when characters haven't even gone yet. It's like, look, <laughs> it's Ant Girl. It's like, what do you mean? We've got Ant <laughs> Man's alive, and then we got Wasp too. Paul, like, Paul Rudd's just like, like, I'm not dead. <laughs> I'm still here, you fucking asshole. Like, uh, what do you mean, uh, America? Chavez, Doctor Strange's like, I'm right here. What? Why did you do what? And she's like, she's gonna be the new sorceress. Like, I, I, okay, I guess so. <laughs> uh, like, so, you know, Hawkeye is just like, oh, I guess I'm getting retired then. It's like, yeah. yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, did you see that? Did you see that? Oh, sorry, sorry. Did I'll you see that video of Michael Douglas being interviewed on the red carpet for Ant Man three, where he says, "Will you be back for Ant Man 4? And he says, "Yeah, if they kill me off." Like, it was just like, <laughs> I want to be out. I want to be done. Imagine uh, that as an actor. Just title. let me die. Yeah. <laughs> it ties uh, into the, the video I sent you over Twitter, Drinker. You can see in our thread. I don't know if you want to play that, or part of it at least. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, sorry, sorry to jump no, out. But while we're looking for that, like, has uh, Young Avengers been confirmed? The all female Young Avengers that, that were teasing i don't know if they're all female but i think they're for sure um well mostly female men. because who would be the who would be the male so miss marvel the ant man i kate casey ant man daughter then you have uh, the, the casey, hawkeye kathy. replacement <laughs> kathy i don't know their names they're like the hawkeye <laughs> replacement girl uh, iron heart iron heart right. um yeah. and as far so, as they're like, all girls so far oh yeah that's what that's what i you, even um even Peter Parker would be too old for that group, right? So it's yeah, like yeah, but no, they might no... get America Chavez in there as well. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's... don't you think they're Sorry. just floating that idea, like floating it? They do this a lot. They'll float well, they... ideas out there and see if it see if it's big. They media gave them an response. after credit scene, Chris. It's practically canon. Uh, I hope right. they do it. I hope <laughs> they do it. Like I'm at a point where because I just don't care about Marvel, they've destroyed everything, right? I was like, all right, hasten the destruction destruction. I hope you just keep doubling down. Yes, bring us the acolyte, bring us the Ray movie, bring us the old female young Avengers. We'll make videos on it and laugh at it, and it's gonna be glorious. A lot of people think the Ray movie won't happen. I still think it will. Oh yeah. I well, think you, it's not you said you, yeah, and you were right about this. It's like out of all of the things that they've commissioned in Lucasfilm, that's probably the one that's got the most chance of happening just because you know it's close to their hearts and they will fast track the shit out of that to try and get it out before yeah, Daisy everyone Ridley gets fired. is the main star they need and she's probably like, yep, let's do it. I'm ready, ready to go when you guys are. Well, also, yeah, you know, work. like them or not, the Star Wars sequel trilogy, uh, uh, all three like of those movies not. made, that's a $4 billion three movie series. Uh, unprecedented yeah, in barely oh, like yes barely but then, still 
have I a mean, look at what the, the viewing numbers of Kenobi and the Star Wars stuff that they made. Like, it's dead. If they like, like they think they might think it'll make money based on the um, yeah, Star Wars yeah. sequels, but it ain't. It's I actually just, wouldn't I be surprised the, the, the if problem. they did. To try and convince you Star Wars is still alive, roll out like the box office numbers for the sequel, specifically TFA, and you'd just be like, that was a long time ago, that, Disney. That, yeah, and also like it's the trajectory that's the problem. It's like TFA yeah. two billion, then Last Jedi 1.3, then uh, Rise of Skywalker barely one billion. I mean, you know, one billion is still a lot of money, don't get me wrong, but it's like half of what the first movie in the trilogy made. You shouldn't yeah. be on that trajectory if you're making good films. And and they have tried to milk any kind of like last remaining popular character, you know, it's like, oh Boba Fett, that that failed. All right, who else do we have? Uh, Obi-Wan will definitely get away. And that was so bad and now finally with, with ahsoka it's like they've just systematically it really is scraping the bottom of the barrel but it's like who have we got left who's a, who even is a soaker it's like yeah they like her from one of the animated shows like all right fine throw her in a live action thing <laughs> So who, el- who else after that? Is there a droid we could make a show on? <laughs> no, 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 no. Who else? Ray. That's all they got. Like... Yeah. I think that that does feel like the final <laughs> like stage of this horrible Ouroboros situation that they finally eat their first creation. They, the yes. first one they actually came up with. There you go. <laughs> Trace uh, Star Wars all the connected way the ends of the human centipede. <laughs> yeah. Just... The thing is, you just know it would have the kind of reception that the Marvels got. This, this would be a film that would get, I don't know, a few hundred million worldwide at best. The sad reality right now is that a Star Wars film, like episode 10, with a lot of characters everyone's familiar with, I don't know how much money that would make, let alone a fucking Ray movie. Yeah. <laughs> like No one cares. They know that we've yeah. known we've known they've known that Star Wars isn't in trouble <laughs> well before Marvel was in trouble. Like they you just look at the last film release to now. It's like that's absolutely fucking nuts. That they haven't put out a Star Wars film since 2019. That's insane. Imagine it's, how panicked they are. They can't figure out what the hell they're supposed to do. And they've run with <laughs> they, they went to the board every single day and they finally concluded it's the Ray movie. That's it. You're right. That's the it's that's the moneymaker. It's the Ray movie. And then everyone the else in the room like, thing again. It's like that's the best we could come up with. Another mass. <laughs> it's, like, it, it, it's astonishing Rise of Skywalker actually got made. Uh, I, I sat in the theater. I, I went and saw that the Chinese theater, and I'm, you know, the Star Wars theater. And that entire film, the entire time I watched it, I was perplexed by it, thinking, did anyone watch the original Star Wars? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I so. uh, it, it, that movie, like, oh, uh, we have a <sighs> we have a device, a map that maps out the wreckage of something that's in the water that would shift all the time. But 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 this thing is supposed to like show you where to go. You uh, have to be standing at the exact right spot to but, set it up with no. Yeah. It, but it's in the water, yeah. moving, and and I I, I that film, I, I think the rise of I used to think Star Trek Into Darkness was the worst big budget science fiction film ever made, and I know Star Wars is science fantasy, but I think Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker might very well be the worst big budget space film ever made and it is it is it is such in terms of the destruction of a franchise man i can't think of something that's worse maybe highlander 2 oh highlander 2 was terrible but it cost a lot less it was, it was worth all. It was worth all of it just to watch the EFAP guys absolutely tearing their hair out trying to understand <laughs> that, like Exegol and how like the the, the Star Destroyer fleet you were doesn't there know for where that. You were the EFAP guys at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that film that lost film our minds is over so that. God awful. Oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah, that was unbelievably a bad. One, one of the worst films like ever made in that category. I agree. It is just. But uh, uh, you look at that movie and you're like, I, as a film editor myself, you sit in an edit bay for, for hours and hours and hours and hours on end trying to make up the logic. You want to make sure that every little beat works. Nothing in that film, none of it, makes a lick of sense. And I I watch that movie and I marvel. I'm like, clearly there is something that hollywood is missing and I, it's not what we're talking about it's it's a it's a fundamental 
I don't know what. And I look at that film and I think, I mean, it is the greatest example of no one knows what the hell they're doing that I've ever seen made by Hollywood. It is so. that bad. It was impressive, that's for sure. Mm. Um, M8566 says, cheers to the bar. Went to see Godzilla again and ended up with a free Marvel's popcorn bucket. I guess they had leftovers from when they were <laughs> Please take our crap. That's all you need to know. They just Wait, like the shoppy, just write whatever movie you're watching on it. Like, it's actually yeah. just fun. There you go. Good. With a smiley face. Wayman Bicephus says, what's the 69? A good thing ruined by a period. <laughs> Oh, oh no! Oh. Depends on who you are. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, Craven Moorhead. Sorry, uh, he also says Craven Moorhead or Buster Cherry. The eternal question. Canada Plus says to the panel, "What's your favorite Christmas songs?" For me, it's a more traditional classic. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. It's actually filled with a wonderful resonating message of hope that really hits me in the feels every time. Hmm. I think mine's is fairy tale of New York because it's two drunk, angry people yelling at each other. <laughs> uh, That's got to be mine. Uh, die hard theme. Be, oh, sorry. <laughs> ah, <laughs> fucking die hard theme. <laughs> die hard theme is good. Uh, baby, it's cold outside is a good one. I know people. Oh, yeah. uh, That'll get you canceled there, Chris. <laughs> yeah, it's a good song. I, I gotta go with White Christmas because I wow. love the I love the movie. I love that movie, and I watched it recently again. I still love it. So I just want just to keep. I want to simp for uh, Bells on Christmas Day again because, uh, seriously, go and uh, read the lyrics of that song. Um, the uh, author of it, right. In the middle of writing it, his son actually died in war. And it was after he got the letter of his son dying in war that he wrote the verse. Um, uh, uh, then in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then it just comes comes in hard with the final final verse of it. Um, then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The hate shall, uh, what is it? The wrong shall fail, right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. And that is why I, I love that, because if wow. the message, if you can really kind of like try and get the message what Christmas is, to me it really, I feel, is it's peace on earth and goodwill to men. And that to me is like the the greatest ideal I could hope for for mankind. And that song just uh, celebrates that. By the way, run DMC's Christmas in Hollis. Don't forget that. <laughs> it, begins, it begins die hard as we're walking up to or driving up to Nakatomi Plaza. Come on. This that is, true, is yeah. Christmas music, as Argo pointed out. Yeah, yeah. McLean's like, ain't got any Christmas music. This is Christmas music, man. Um, John... Jordan Pendragon says Aquaman comes out tomorrow, and as soon as I'm off work, I'm heading directly to the cinema to see Die Hard instead, which is my <laughs> local theater is screening for the film's 35th anniversary. That is time well spent, sir. Hell yeah. I endorse that one. Um, Matthew Leach says, Merry Christmas, lads. Mubler, your favorite movie of the year is The Killer, and no fat for it yet. For shame. Maybe in January when fuck all is coming out. <laughs> yeah, we've been completely stacked up on um, being able to do anything this year. And we're, people are like going to cover Aquaman 2 and Rebel Moon, right? And it's like, maybe one of them, probably Rebel Moon, because it'll be funny. But um, yeah, we we got loads and loads of episodes we need to get out. We've got loads of ideas, so covering stuff has just been difficult. The Lord of the Rings video was kind of like a, please leave us alone for a second. <laughs> Eat that for like eight hours. Yeah. Uh, TGV Monster says, people believe that the film Poltergeist is cursed. What's your opinion on that? I'm not surprised given that they used real human bones in the film because it was apparently cheaper, which is a bit distasteful. I had no clue about that, actually. Hmm. I like Poltergeist as a movie, but I didn't know was there problems <laughs> that, that befell the cast and crew? I don't know. <laughs> hey, man, maybe well, a time, okay? Heather, I don't know nothing Heather, about Heather it. O'Rourke uh, died, and so did Dominic uh, 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 O'Rourke. Well, I, I, I know nothing about it, uh, but I'm going to say yes, it probably is. Fair enough. That's my, that's uh, my take. Yeah, good take. Ghost Thank of Drinker's you. Liver says, with Christmas on the horizon, who's seen a Charlie Brown Christmas? It's a half-hour timeless treasure. Also, kudos to Eric for his legal resolution. 
Oh yeah, shout out. Um, yeah, we we're behind. That's finally behind us, and yeah, can't wait to get ice on three to you guys. Nice, nice one, man. By the way, I just want to shout out in the Charlie Brown Christmas when Charlie Brown opens up his mailbox looking for Christmas cards, and he says hello in there, and his mailbox echoes with emptiness. Ooh. Is one of the saddest Christmas moments of all time. <laughs> um. This is, next one is a three-parter from Samson the Mighty. He says, Drinker and Panel, Merry Christmas to all my holiday. Recommendation is Fat Man with Mel Gibson as Santa. Shows us the perspective of Santa this time of year, not giving gifts to many because uh, well, because they're little shits, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Drinker, we didn't get the Super Chat catch-up from the last open bar. Just wanted to ask if you and Mauler both got a message about YouTube. Well, in fact, we did get a Super Chat catch-up, and I did it, and it's on my second channel already. I posted it up early this afternoon, so, yeah, preempted that one. Um, and also, uh, panel anime recommendation, Bastard on Netflix. A powerful mage wants to conquer the world and put every woman in the world in his harem. My mind said, the drinker approves of this lifestyle choice. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, not seen that that anime, but uh, sounds interesting. Um, but yeah, I know we've been going for for about three hours now, so I will probably wrap it up pretty soon. Uh, I want to say thank you first of all to everyone who's sent on these amazing super chats. You've been extremely generous as always, um, and if we haven't answered them all, we will absolutely do it in the super chat catch up. And secondly, thank you to my mods for doing their usual sterling work. Um, appreciate you guys uh, a huge amount and lastly and mostly thank you to my guests you guys have been an awesome panel tonight i this appreciate all of you coming thanks on. for having us Had a yeah play. thanks for having us thank man. you thank you um and i just want to say like is there anything you guys want to make us aware of that you've got coming up anything you want to plug anything you want to um sell everybody now is a, an ideal time <laughs> Well, uh, following Mr. July's uh, extraordinary success with his own creator uh, uh, comic, Isom, I would like to say that I myself am doing an audio drama uh, that, Ooh. you know, uh, I'm doing it nice. with Max Allen Collins, the writer of Road to Perdition. Uh, his 19 novel series, the Nathan Heller detective series, we are adapting the first two novels as an audio drama but it, it, think about it as a movie but with no pictures and todd stashwick the actor who played liam shaw on picard season three plays the main character nathan heller and it starts out in 1932 and it deals with the assassination of chicago mayor cermak and you deal with the al capone the wake of al Capone and frank uh, al capone and frank nitty and all that so we're going to be crowdfunding that in the beginning of 2024. So look out for Excellent. it. It's called True Noir, the Nathan Heller case books. And when we start the, I just finished, I directed and produced a proof of concept because I didn't want to just say we're doing it. I wanted you to actually hear what we did. And I'm really excited about it. It turned out way better than I thought. And Stashwick is great. And I'm so privileged to be working with both Max Allen Collins and Todd Stashwick. Awesome, man. Sounds excellent. Um, does anyone else have anything coming up they want to make us aware of? Uh, just uh, not anything big, just uh, the story that just put on film thread um, about the D files. I put it in the private chat. I think I can even, can I put it in the comment? Uh, uh, you can, yeah. If you put it up there and I will, I will put it up um, for everyone to see. It's part one of a story we had done uh, a review of Wish that got attention, um, not just from current and former employees at Disney, but also people within the animation industry. A lot of people reached out to us uh, privately, and which has resulted in part one of a story written by Alan Ng called The D Files. And part one basically deals with uh, the ousting of John Lasseter. And the real behind-the-scenes story of what happened. Now, a lot of the the sources are unnamed in this, but they're also unnamed when he was basically taken down by Me Too charges. You didn't you didn't actually get to know who the sources were 
for all of that. I knew John Lasseter years ago. He was on the board for a film festival that I was the, the festival director of. Um, knew he was there um, two years in a row. Great guy. And that was the beginning of the fall of Disney. And this will be a continuing series of stories on film threat. We're going to put out every Wednesday starting next year. Um, leading up to the present and the activist rot that is destroying the company. And unless it's addressed, I really think that uh, Disney's in for hard times, not just 2023. You're going to have a lot of 2023s in a row for, for this company. So um, read that story, check it out and uh, subscribe to film threat if you haven't already. And I appreciate, uh, appreciate the invitation drinker. Mm -hmm. And always love being here and talking to people, talking to people who I watch on a regular basis, you know, so it's a lot of fun. So thanks, thanks very man. much. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm sorry we never got a chance to actually get through because I read that article before we went live. You shared it with me and it's really interesting and I'd meant to talk about it, but we got so sidetracked just talking about all the other stuff for like the first hour of the stream. We just didn't have time in the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, just check it out. You can go to film threat and uh, I don't know, uh, search for it. The D files. Thanks, man. Cool. Um, uh, I will say, I uh, guess for myself as well, um, Rogue Elements, my my short film yeah. um, based on the Ryan Drake books, uh, it's almost ready to go, and wow. we'll probably be releasing the first trailer within you know the next few weeks. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing that with the world, and I think yeah, people. Yeah. I hope people amazing, are dude. Be That's amazing. You did that. Congrats. I love that shit, man. It's uh, gonna be cool. It's it's an interesting thing to be doing. I tell you, it's crazy that it was over a year ago that we did the Kickstarter for that, and you know, in all that time, you know, we've done the, all the scripting, all the pre-production, all the principal photography, and almost all of the editing and and post-production stuff, and we're almost ready to go now. So. It's been quite, it's been quite a long journey, but I appreciate everyone being like super understanding and patient as we went through it. And we are working our asses off to make the best end product that we can for you guys. So it's a huge you. accomplishment. I mean, that is huge. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, yeah, man. I guess to everyone else who's joined us tonight, thanks for for mm -hmm. doing this. Thanks for making open bar like this this excellent uh, occasion that it's become. Like we really enjoy doing it. Yeah, how many I'll years are we that. going now? 70 something? 77 <laughs> years. <we've been> doing. <laughs> yeah. Um 500th episode. Yeah. Hey, uh, got a small update that I think is pretty cool. Uh even though they're not available anymore, there will be a second but uh the fulfillment is well underway for the Shadow of the Conqueror. Uh, I've been the seeing people novel. nice. I'm it's seeing a graphic great. novel. Yeah, so uh, we did a special second edition release of the novel in and this is the uh, leather bound version. They turned out so friggin' amazing. It looks so good. Like this yeah. is like genuinely top, top quality stuff. And so really, really happy with that. You get the additional kind of, you know, covers that text in the thing. And then of course, so that's turned out brilliantly. And then, yeah, the uh, graphic novel, um, and this is the leather bound version right here. And it's just turned out so, so good. Like so, so good. Uh, very happy with that. And uh, volume two is well underway. We have all, already all the artwork done for volume two. And uh, we're working on colors at the moment. We hope to get the coloring done by uh, uh, end of January, if everything goes uh, according to plan. And then we'll have volume two, which is going to be three times bigger than even volume one. Uh, <coughs> so that is going to be <clears throat> awesome. And, and uh, these are all the variant covers here on the shelves. So they, nice. It's been very rolling nice, out. Man. People are getting their copies, yeah. and it's a very exciting time. Been seeing uh, pictures of people because they're they're holding up the alpha core. It's like, hey, I got both yes. of them. I got alpha core. I, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Like, love yeah, that. seeing I, alpha core and shadow the conqueror yeah. together. I absolutely love that. That's fucking sick, man. Uh, yeah. But that that's all I got. Alpha core is still. I mean, we got a month left in the pre order campaign, but we're already fulfilling. So you can get your stuff uh, right now. It's um, closing in on one point two uh, million dollars on this uh pre order window it's been fucking insane man i appreciate all the all the supporters uh chuck dixon can't go wrong with chuck dixon the great uh joe bennett as well on it so if you have not had a chance to go check that out over at ripperverse.com you should go check check that out and get in um on uh alpha nice awesome man. So everyone's awesome. got stuff going on it's great to see yeah yeah, I mean, yeah, like, you yeah. well just mention the Lord of the Rings thing now because it is out. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> eight hours of myself, Rags, Fringy, Gary, Drinker, 
from my bananas in it for a bit as well. <laughs> like the, it's, uh, it's just talking about Lord of the Rings extensively with with all of the references you would want, as in like visually, audio, and plenty of additional stuff for like how it was made, why it's amazing, and what it means to all of us. A lot of us give little speeches about our favorite things throughout the movies, and I just uh, yeah, easy recommend for anyone who likes Lord of the Rings or us. It and it's a great ages it, to edit. <laughs> it's it's the twentieth anniversary of Return of the King. Uh, this holiday season and it's a great way to celebrate you know 22 years of of the films and and tolkien's work hell yeah no it was it was a pleasure to be part of it i really enjoyed it um and i want to say to everyone well yeah this is the last open bar before christmas so i hope you all have a fantastic christmas um eat and drink and be merry and uh, we will catch you on the next one merry christmas merry merry christmas. holidays and happy new year uh, but that's all we got for today. So go away now. Bye. Farewell.